large city councilor and the chair on the Boston City Council's uh, Committee on Education. Um, today is March the 16th. Um, the hearing is, this hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov city council TV and broadcasted on Xfinity Channel 8, um, RCN Channel 82, Files um, 964. In accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, um, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving um, public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement um, that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. The city council will be conducting uh, this hearing remotely. This enables the city council to carry out its responsibility while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. Um, this docket that we are here um, today uh, is also going to be accepting written comments, uh, which may be sent to the committee email at ccc.education uh, at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Um, public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. If you are looking to virtually testify today, please email Megan Conaval um, at megan.kavanagh at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Docket 0247, order for a hearing to discuss the academic performance and social and emotional well-being of LGBTQ plus students in the Boston Public Schools. This matter was sponsored by Councilor Lada and myself and was referred to the committee on January 25th, 2023. Today, I am joined by my colleagues, Council President Flynn from District 2, Councilor Aaron Murphy at large, Councilor Tanya Anderson, District 7, Councilor Lara, District 6. For um, the administration panel, we have with us Jill Carter, who is the Senior Executive Director of Boston Public Schools Office of Health and um, Wellness, Becky Schuster, who is the Assistant um, Superintendent of Equity at the Boston Public Schools, Carmen Fonseca, who is the LGBTQ plus student student support manager for the Office of um, Equity, and Danielle Murray, who's the assistant head of school at Boston Latin Academy. And we're also joined by my good friend um, in good trouble, Quincy Roberts, who's the executive director of the LGBTQ plus advancement for the city of Boston. Um, and for our advocate panel, we have with us uh, Stephanie Brooks, who is the executive director of Mass Commission on LGBTQ plus youth. Um, Kamani James, um, who will be joining us at 315. Uh, he is a former BPS student and a former youth representative for the Boston um, School Committee. And really excited that he is able to join us. As well as Dr. Uh, Jackman, who will be available later on today, um, who is a psychologist and the founder of in, in, Info um, Psych Inc., um, who is also a, uh, uh, has had a lot of history with the Boston Public Schools. Um, so I would like to start uh, with opening remarks and recognizing um, and leading with my council colleague, uh, Councilor Lara, for opening remarks. You now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to um, all of my city council colleagues, the administration, and member of the community for being here for this really important conversation. Last June, as a part of our commitment to a more direct and participatory democracy, our office designed the Letters from the Future campaign, where we asked members of the LGBTQ community all across the city to send us visionary letters that outline solutions for some of our most pressing issues. Far too often, we, we talk about policy, we really limit ourselves and what we think is possible by the external conditions that we find ourselves in. And it's really important for us to be strategic, but I think it's only one part of the equation. Our creative ability to see a different world for ourselves and for our communities is as equally as important. In these letters from the future, queer folks from all across the city were clear about what we could do to to move beyond pride toward policy. Housing, safety, space for community building, protection of LGBTQ youth, and ensuring safe affirming spaces for BPS students were all issues of importance that came through in those letters. And so today's hearing is a part of moving the Beyond Pride policy platform um, from our office forward. I'm really grateful for Councilor Mejia to be a co-sponsor on this issue as the share of education with me. Um, 
I am, I want to make a note before I cede the floor that we are having a conversation around BPS students and there are not any current, current BPS students here with us today. Um, we went through incredible lengths to try to make that happen and were met with roadblocks um, at every juncture. And so I wanted to say for the record that I'm a little, you know, I'm discouraged that we are having a conversation around students and young people specifically queer young people when they are not here in the room. And that my hope is that we can continue this conversation outside of the city council um, in a forum that is more welcoming to having the voices of young people represented here uh, so that we can hear from them what their actual experiences and needs are inside of BPS. I wanna extend gratitude to the queer young people who filled out the survey and let us know that they wanted us to really focus on this issue. And I hope that we can hear more about what the administration and BPS is doing to support um, their well-being. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lada. And I want to note that we were really lucky to um, be able to invite Kamani James, who is a former BPS graduate. And I want to just underscore the um, the sentiments uh, that you just mentioned in terms of having current students. Um, it is my hope that as we continue to create space uh, for hearings that we are also super mindful of the timing and things of that nature. And, and so um, we are, we hear that loud and clear. I'm gonna go next to uh, my colleague, counselor in the order of arrival. I'm going to go to counselor, I believe it is counselor um, Murphy. You now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, chair. Um, and thank you to the sponsors for this important hearing as the co-chair of education and a former Boston Public School teacher for many years, decades, um, know, you know, the well-being of all our students is a priority of mine and also being the chair of public health and mental health know that, you know, advocating and doing the work in our office around the needs, the mental health and social emotional needs of all of our children across the city is so important, but I'm, um, you know, grateful to be here today with Quincy and, you know, other people speaking on behalf of this specific community that needs to be looked at differently, I believe, because they, if they do not, and I appreciate what you said, Council Lara, that you invited students to speak, you know, their voice so that we could hear directly, because we can make assumptions and we can, you know, assume that things are happening, but it is important to hear directly from the students so that we can advocate in a way that is, you know, the most effective and in a way that is sensitive to their needs because a lot of times we make assumptions about different communities that i don't think is fair that we should really be speaking directly to not not to, and i know not to take away from the great work that could in his office and other people on this call um you know do and you do you know work in in the spaces with these youth but we know from the data and just if any of us have, you know, worked with or, you know, live with or, you know, just know that this population many times has a different set of needs and we have to address that. And what are we doing on the council to advocate for that type of legislation and BPS and making sure that we're being a strong voice so that they don't feel like they need, um, you know, that they're not being heard or that they don't feel safe or that, you know, there's not spaces for them to thrive in our school system, because we need to make sure that all kids feel that they're welcome, but also in a space where they're learning. Because at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that they're learning academically, but we're also creating spaces for them to grow socially and emotionally so that they can be strong adults, young adults in our community. So thank you for having this hearing and I'm glad to be on the call, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. And I am going to put on my glasses because I just realized that I did not see and call upon the first person that was on, in line, which is Councillor President um, Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you now have the floor. My apologies. No, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I want to say thank you to Councillors Lara and Councillor Mejia for sponsoring this important hearing. It's critical our LGBTQ plus students are supported in BPS, especially during this time of increased transphobia, um, hate crimes in our city, in our nation. Um, so there's a lot of discrimination and bullying. Um, we also know that many states are, are passing laws specifically targeting 
LGBTQ plus youth in attempting to erase um, programs in, in various schools, maybe not here in Massachusetts, but across the country. We also have seen at Boston Children's Hospital that they're doing tremendous work in support of LGP, LGBTQ students, but they're being harassed almost uh, frequently with bomb threats and, and other types of demonstrations. But um, so we have, a, even in the most progressive city in the country here in Boston, that it's, you know, discrimination against the LGBTQ community is, is, is prevalent. Um, and just thinking of the, the young people as, as Council Mahir and Council Alara is focused this, this on, this hearing on, my, just on a side note, my, my wife and I went on Sunday to the, um, to the gay men's, um, Boston Gay Men's Cho Chorus concert, and they had a peacock among us, among pigeons. And that's what Mayor Wu um, discussed and it's, it's a book that many people probably know, but it's a book of trying to celebrate our differences, celebrate our diversity, but trying to treat everybody with respect. And I learned a lot from that performance, from the concert, from the, the comments by Maya Wu, but I'm also interested in, in hearing from uh, young people about this issue. I'm proud to have two specific groups in my district that, that help um, gay and lesbian youth, including Bridge Over Troubled Waters on West Street, Break Time on Portland Street. So they do tremendous work. Thank you to my friend Quin Quincy Roberts, outstanding job him and your, your team does in the city. And just wanna say thank you to my city council colleagues, Council Lara, Council Mejia for their important work on this issue. Um, thanks for giving me an extra minute to go over. Thank you guys. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. I will now move on to Councillor Anderson from District 7. You now have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate you holding, um, well, uh, for the for the lead sponsors, um, Councillor Lara and Mejia and Councillor, uh, I think, is that the two of, just the two of you? I'm sorry, I apologize, yeah. Um, to the lead sponsors who filed this, um, this is something that's very close and near to my heart. Um, it's a uh, the field one of uh, the field that I've worked in for years uh, in my professional experience. So I really appreciate this uh, topic being brought to this uh, platform. Uh, really looking forward to uh, talking about the different layers of this conversation. I think um, it's such a multifaceted uh, topic that one which of course needs uh, deserves attention, but patience and. Um, best practices and understanding, and hopefully that we are um, coming to a resolution that would actually address the need. Um, the social and emotional well-being of our students, of course, is a priority for all students, but um, when it comes to more disenfranchised or vulnerable populations, such as the LGBTQ students, uh, students that where uh, with to whom English is not a first language uh, and other uh, students with uh, disabilities as well um, have uh, suffer uh, a different level of uh, navigating um, or lack of resources to navigate um, emotional intelligence or uh, resources to navigate their emotional intelligence. So. I am excited with this conversation, um, Chair. I do have a previous um, uh, engagement with the Northeastern um, Anti-Displacement Master Plan for District 7 taking place in one of the conference rooms today, uh, but I did want to be here and I will be popping in and out. So if you call on to me and I happen to be not be around, just know that I thought this was super important and wanted to be here, but um, may, be sometimes in the room and have to pop back and forth um, in this hearing and the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson, and I definitely understand, you know, we are all juggling 101 things and the fact that you are here for opening comments and um, showing up, just raising your hand and saying that you're present for the conversation, I know means a lot to our constituents who are tuning in. We really do appreciate the effort. I'm going next to Councilor Arroyo, District 5. You now have the floor. 
I want to thank the original sponsors for this. Uh, Quincy, I see you, Quincy Roberts, and the work you're doing every day. Uh, for me, my goal here, uh, and I, I do wish we had current students here. I understand that we don't, but that doesn't mean we won't find other ways to engage them. But my goal here is when we have what is very clearly a population in the LGBTQ community that is under assault nationally, when it comes to our students especially and the ways in which we are in this country trying to legislate how they are educated, how they are addressed, how we are moving about uh, with acceptance in these communities, I wanna make sure that we are leading on every facet. And so this conversation for me, you know, if we're doing great work, that's fantastic. I wanna hear that, but I also wanna hear where and how we can be better and where and how we can actually push policy, push exact actual actionable items that create a better, more thriving community for LGBTQ plus children in schools and in an environment where they feel not tolerated, but accepted and welcome. And so that's the that's the goal I'm trying to make sure we get to, especially understanding that a large majority of our BPS children are children of color. And there is a intersection there where uh, communities of color and LGBTQ community are not always treated the way they should be by people of color. There's a lot of sort of ingrown. Uh, this is not just a white community issue or a black community issue or Latino community issue. There's a lot of uh, misinformation and a lot of hatred and, and ways in which people advocate for or against children in this community. So it's you're dealing with the perils of that. And so I want to make sure we're doing everything we can to make a safe space for our children, knowing that there's a whole lot of inter intersectional aspects to this that they are dealing with on a on a daily basis beyond just being able to focus on what their what their curriculum is. So I want to make sure we're doing everything we can. So bring me those things. Those were my questions will be focused more on what we're not doing that we can do. And I'm grateful for all the things we are already doing, but where we can improve is where I'm focusing. Thank you, Counselor Arroyo, um, for grounding us in what I hope it will be a solution-focused conversation because we can only fix what we need, uh, what we know is broken, right? And so this is really not an opportunity and I keep encouraging BPS to come into this space ready to share the highlights that, yes, we do appreciate the good that is happening and the work that is um, going on. But, you know, the more vulnerable we are in terms of where we can grow, uh, the better we'll be to be able to support and advocate for those uh, changes. So want to underscore and uplift that I like Councilor Arroyo and really looking forward to the spaces that we need to lean into to address um, how we can be supportive. So for me, this is an incredibly important topic, especially um, in a moment when we're seeing, like my colleague, Councilor um, President Flynn mentioned in his opening remarks, several states are presenting and implementing legislation um, that is meant to hurt people that are identifying as LGBTQ+, right? So today's topic is focused on our youth that identify as LGBTQ+, Plus, and it's our responsibility to ensure this vulnerable population is protected in light um, of such violence. Based on research, we know that L lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans and queer LGBTQ students are harassed, bullied, and victimized at disproportionate rates compared to their heterosexual and cisgender counterparts. The vast majority experience harassment or assault during in-person school, and many heard um, School employees use homophobic language, according to a national survey of LGBTQ students conducted in 2021 and released this month by GLSEN, a group that promotes safe and inclusive schools. Most LGBTQ students are going to schools that are unsafe, unwelcoming, and not affirming said Caitlin Clark, a senior uh, research associate at um, Glesson who co-authored that report. 45% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the past year. 36% of LGBTQ youth reported that they have been physically threatened or harmed due to either their sexual orientation or gender identity. 73% of LGBTQ youth reported experiencing symptoms of anxiety and 58% of LGBTQ youth reported experiencing symptoms of depression. 60% of LGBTQ youth who wanted mental health care in the past years were not able to get it. 
and fewer than one in three transgender and non-binary youth find, uh, found their home to be um, gender affirming. All of this um, has the mental health implications that need to be taken very seriously. Many LGBTQ youth feel isolated and rejected by their school peers or classmates, and some even reported not being accepted by their teachers or school administrators. The isolation doesn't stop there, though. Many of these young people are disowned by their family members, including parents, grandparents, and siblings. Reported rates of depression, hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts were far higher among LGBTQ students than their peers last school year, and highest among transgender and non-binary youth, according to a survey of students in 20 states by the nonprofit Youth Truth. More than 80% of high school students who identify as transgender or non-binary and, and nearly 70% of girls cited depression, stress, or anxiety as obstacles to learning um, last school year. So, you know, there's a lot of data here and I'm not gonna keep going on with the data. The, the data is clear. Um, there is no uh, question as to why we're having this hearing here today is that we need to really uh, lean into this work and figure out what we need to do um, more of um, to create spaces where young people feel seen, heard, especially during um, our post-pandemic uh, transition back into schools. Uh, we have seen an uptick of mental health and wellness issues that have bubbled up to the top. And my hope is that in this conversation, we'll not only be able to lean in to the work, but we'll walk out of here with some very specific things that we can all do differently moving forward. So with that, I'm going to start um, with, I will um, move to the first panel, um, which is Jill Carter, the Senior Executive Director of BPS Office of Health and Wellness. You now have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, City Councilor Mejia, um, Lara, and other members present. Uh, thank you very much for calling this hearing to discuss the academic performance and social emotional well-being of our LGBTQ plus students in the Boston Public Schools. My name is Jill Carter. I'm the Senior Executive Director for the Office of Health and Wellness. Health and Wellness is in teaching and learning. It's a department in the academic division. The Health and Wellness Office is made up of four teams, social emotional learning, health education, physical education and physical activity, and wellness policy promotions and evaluation. Our office leads and coordinates the district's work to implement a whole school, whole community, whole child approach to health and wellness through our district wellness policy. We monitor district, school, and student data and use this information to drive services and investments for health and wellness policy programs and practices. We lead the district's administration of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or the YRBS data. This is data that was mentioned in today's hearing order. Uh, specific to today's hearing, the Office of Health and Wellness works collaboratively, um, excuse me, collaboratively with the Office of Equity and other departments on BPS's comprehensive approach to LGBTQ plus affirming support, which I can share a little bit more about later. I just wanna start by saying, um, as the hearing order states, Boston Public Schools five year strategic plan focuses on academic recovery for BPS students with a particular focus on the social emotional well being and development of students most in need. The BPS mission states that every child in every classroom in every school gets what they need. Additionally, our wellness policy commits us to actively promote the social emotional and physical health and wellness of all students to advance both their healthy development and readiness to learn. We are committed to fostering a safe, healthy and sustaining learning environment using the whole school, whole community, a whole child approach as outlined in the wellness policy and calling out support for LGBTQ plus students. To this end, we are happy to be here today to discuss 
how LGBTQ plus students are centered in the conversation, recognizing that when students feel that adults and peers care about their learning, care about them as individuals, and feel a deep sense of belonging at school, they are more likely to succeed academically and thrive. So building on the assets and strengths of our students, we aim to address the health risks highlighted in the hearing order. To begin, I'd like to just share some updated data from the 2021 Youth Risk Behavior Survey or YRBS. In the 2021 National YRBS, 29% of Boston high school students identified as LGBTQ+, lesbian or gay, bisexual, questioning, or I describe my sexual identity in some other way. Statistical analysis shows that students are not more likely to identify as LGBTQ+, based on their race and ethnicity. Like the total population, the majority of students that identify as LGBTQ plus are Black and Latinx students. Boston is one of the national YRBS sites that asks about transgender identity. 1.7% of students identify as transgender. 2% are unsure of their gender identity. The small sample size does not allow us to conduct subgroup comparison for transgender students. Therefore, the T commonly used in the acronym LGBTQ plus is not included in the subgroup data. However, research shows that transgender students face similar health disparities that LGBTQ plus students face. There's overlap in health outcomes and statistical analysis also shows us that students are not more likely to identify as transgender based on their race, ethnicity, or sex. BPS's academic data does not allow us to measure academic achievement for LGBTQ plus students. Academic performance measures for the district use demographic data collected by DESI or the Department of Education we do not collect sexual identity orientation or transgender identity information that can be tied to specific students' academic records. However, the YRBS data, or the YRBS survey asked students during the past 12 months, how would they describe your grades in school? Mostly A's, B's, C's, D's, or F's. When analyzed by sexual identity data, students who identify as LGB are more likely to describe their grades in schools as mostly C's, D's, and F's during the last 12 months than straight students. Statistical analysis of the 2021 Boston High School YRBS also indicates that LGBTQ plus students are at greater risk of injury and violence, bullying, suicidality, and feeling disconnected from people at school. Notably, during the 12 months before the survey, 66% of LGB students and 67% of Q plus students experienced persistent sadness compared to 37% of straight students. 36% of LGB students and 41% of Q plus students engaged in self-harming behaviors compared to 12% of straight students. And 17% of LGB students and 15% of Q plus students attempted suicide one or more times compared to 3% of straight students. This is what our students have told us. This is their, the voice is speaking through the survey data. We've also shared data with city councilors that indicates disparities for LGBTQ plus students in risk behaviors related to sexual health, substance use, unhealthy weight management, and physical activity. 
Research clearly shows that when youth feel connected to their school, they are less likely to experience mental health issues or substance abuse, take sexual health risks, and participate in violence. Most importantly, school connectedness helps students thrive. It has long-term impacts on student health and well-being. School connectedness is when students feel that adults and peers care about their learning and about them as individuals and feel a deep sense of belonging at school. We know that youth of color and or youth who identify as LGBTQ plus often feel less connected at school. Boston Youth Risk Behavior Survey data supports this finding. Together, we are striving to increase school connectedness. Before I turn it over to Becky Schuster, I'll just highlight the work, a few elements of the work that the Office of Health and Wellness does to support these efforts. Our office receives CDC funding to work with the Office of Equity, Health Services, and other BPS departments to deliver LGBTQT, excuse me, LGBTQ plus affirming sexual health education, including education on protective med, uh, methods and STD AIDS prevention, and lessons on gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. We also offer professional development and instructional coaching related to rights, respect, and responsibility. That is the K-12 sexual health curriculum for the district. We lead on distributing condoms and promotional uh, materials to all high schools and sponsor an at BPS Teen Health Instagram account to increase student awareness of available sexual health services and LGBTQ plus friendly providers. Finally, we disseminate culturally and linguistically inclusive information to the BPS community um, on the affirming policies and practice and resources available. With that, I thank you and I'll turn it over to, to Becky. If that's what, what you had in mind. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, just take over here. I really appreciate. The I leadership. apologize. No, I apologize. No, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you, Jill. I really do appreciate it. And she is actually the next person on the list. So um, good tracking there. Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, su Assistant Superintendent of Equity, uh, Becky Schuster, you now have the floor. And I want to just be mindful of the time. Like just uh, so just I did not start the tracker, but I am going to Becky. So go on ahead. You have the floor. Understood. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia and Councillor Lara, for giving us the opportunity to speak about a topic that I'm very passionate about, and I know everyone in the Zoom room shares the passion about what do we need to be doing to ensure that every student in the Boston Public Schools who identifies as LGBTQ+, is safe, is cherished, can flourish in our schools. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk about the efforts that we are currently making that I'm very proud of. And thank you for joining us in the wish for more resources, uh, more effective interventions on behalf of our students. And I'm also pleased to be here with Quincy Roberts, um, who, with whom we have a growing partnership um, around advancing the work for our youth. So I look forward to hearing from him as well. Um, the Office of Equity, as you heard from my colleague, Joe Carter, is um, at the center of supporting our LGBTQ students in the Boston Public Schools. We have had a full-time staff member as part of our team. Um, this is the third year um, of having an LGBTQ plus student support manager on our team. Um, Carmen Fonseca is here with us today. And I know um, I will try to speak briefly so that we'll have plenty of time for discussion with Carmen about the extraordinary work that she's doing and continuing to expand. And we also have Danielle Murray here from the Boston Latin School. She's been with the district for 23 years doing um, a well known to our students, families and staff who identify as LGBTQ plus and currently uh, leading the GSA at Boston Latin School. Um, in addition to that, we also have a full time, uh, no, a part time uh, social work intern who works on our team on behalf of this population, as well as a part time employee who is solely focused on supporting our GSAs. That's Shaq Jones, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. He's out of the country at the moment. 
Um, we already shared a great deal of information with the counselors beforehand about our multifaceted strategies to support our LGBTQ plus students. And um, Jill Carter just outlined some of them for you, but I wanna highlight a few others. First, I wanna tell you that we have strong, detailed policies in the Boston Public Schools that are unequivocal in ensuring that our LGBTQ plus students have full access to all activities, to all facilities, have the option to uh, use a protocol for name changes, um, have the um, opportunity to identify their gender as they wish, including to identify as gender non-binary. And that policy, the, that core policy that affirms our transgender and um, our policy that protects transgender and gender nonconforming students was actually recognized several years ago by the Centers for Disease Control as a national model and is used routinely by them as a model for the, for the nation. Um, we've been excited in the last, uh, this will be our second year of ensuring that all students have the opportunity to have affirming names on their diplomas. We've done some good work in making progress around gender inclusive and expansive athletics. Um, and we also thank our city councilors for working in partnership with us around the city ordinance regarding staff record updates and we're making good progress on that. I know we're not here specifically to talk about staff, but of course, if we're going to support our students, we need our LGBTQ plus staff also to be respected, affirmed, celebrated, appreciated for their um, unique and essential contributions. In the last two school years, um, in 21-22, our office responded to 185 specific requests for support for our students. And the word is spreading about Carmen's excellent work um, because this year, as of this week, we've already responded to 172 requests for support. So we are on track for a significant increase in supplying those services. And that can include requests for record updates, safety checks of students, assisting families who have concerns about whether they feel fully affirmed um, in their schools giving coaching to staff. Staff will call us and say, I really want to make sure I'm being welcoming for the student. What else can I do to go the extra mile? Um, is there a book we can read in our class that will model inclusion, that will share a beautiful story about a young person who has an LGBTQ plus identity? And of course, referrals to resources. And we have a number of partnerships that are well established and continuing to grow. Um, and sometimes those requests um, give us the opportunity to refer folks to other resources in the Boston community, some of which have already been mentioned today. Uh, Shaq's work in partnership with Carmen and others to support our GSAs. Currently, while our data tells us that about 75 of our schools have GSAs meeting, this school year and last school year, about 20 of them have specifically reached out and asked for extra supports from our office and um, from SHAC. We also um, were really pleased to participate over the last few years in a research study in partnership with Boston College School of Education and Human Development on best practices for GSAs. We wanna make sure not only that we have GSAs, Gender and Sexualities Alliances, but that we are applying the most effective ways to connect with our young people, the most effective activities to have, the types of programming and supports that our students need. So it was very exciting to participate in that research and apply learnings from that research. We have, as I think all of the counselors know, we have seen a rise since the pandemic in off-track behavior in general. I heard that, Councilor Mejia. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I reset it. I gave you another 30 seconds, but I will just reset it. Just give you, just give you a heads up. Just... Thank you so much. Um, so we have seen a rise in bias-based incidents of all kinds, including um, related to sexual orientation and gender identity. And so we're actively engaged in prevention work. Um, we are doing uh, numerous trainings for staff so that they have the skills to intervene and recognize um, bias-based incidents and bias-based bullying. We are doing uh, support work with our students, including our 24-7 Respect Program that specifically teaches our students about their rights and responsibilities and includes an anti-gay incident scenario and how to respond to that. 
uh, as well as providing other curriculum into our schools, um, both for adults and for young people. And I just want to say before I close that I'm particularly proud to work with Carmen Fonseca every day because she brings the intersectional lens that my district counselor Arroyo mentioned earlier. And you'll hear that when you hear her speak more about her work. Thank you, um, Becky, for your, your comments. Um, I'm going to just remind everyone, kind of help you all, just for those folks who follow at least my hearings, just know that I'm always looking for us to lean in and be a little bit more vulnerable. Um, it's great to hear all of the amazing work at BPS, which I know is really important part of these hearings because we want to uplift all of the work that we are doing. But I am really going to continue again for the record to state that it's really important for us when we hold these um, hearings is to really also lean in a little bit more on some of the vulnerability factors of things that we are struggling with, things that we need to help support with uh, some of the shortcomings. Because what I don't want is for people to just think that we're just here to just um, highlight all of the amazing things that we are doing, which is great. But I think the hearing is really an opportunity for us to look at, you know, what are some of the things that we need to focus on. Um, and while I have the floor, I just wanted to acknowledge that my colleague, Counselor Louis Jean, has also joined us. I'm going to move on next to Calming, um, followed by Danielle, and then Quincy. And then I'm going to go into, uh, we have uh, Kamani James, who's going to be joining us um, at 3.15. And I want to make sure that they're able to uh, participate as they are out of the country and uh, joined us at the last minute so that we can at least have some youth voice in the space. OK, um, I Carmen. think you're going to be happy to hear that actually um, Carmen Fonseca and Daniel Murray will be involved during the questioning and discussion, but they're not going to present. So you can move directly to Quincy Roberts. Awesome. After time. awesome. And um, great. Thank you for that, Becky. And uh, I really do appreciate it. So I'm going to move on next to uh, Quincy. You now have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Um, First, I just want to thank um, the two co-chairs um, who brought this up, uh, Council Laura, Council Mejia. Um, and I want to say on the record, this is 365 for everyone that's on this call, all the counselors. So I just want to give a big shout out to the counselors that are on this call because it's more than just this hearing. It's 365 of this work behind the scenes. And we may not agree on everything, but we are working for the same cause. So I appreciate you all. So hi, everyone. I am Quincy J. Roberts, Sr. I'm the inaugural executive director for the mayor's office for LGBTQ plus advanced this, as everyone has already said, this is near and dear to my heart as a former educator. Shout out to Jeremiah E. Brooke, uh, Burke, I'm sorry, um, fellow uh, teacher there. Um, and this is where I got my passion for young folks, specifically gay straight alliances or what our young folks are calling now gender and sexuality alliances. So in Boston, of course, we are committed with a hub where we do everything first. Um, so we're committed here to protecting and promoting LGBT communities and their rights. Um, with this, we have to start at our most vulnerable, which is black and brown trans individuals. And then it gets even worse when we get down to our young folks. So um, a first thing on my job, um, I met with the mayor's youth council. And in that youth council, um, we had a couple of young folks talk about the lack of presence when it came to uh, queer support. And what they really meant by queer support, because I questioned them, I wanted to talk to them um, to really get to know how we can help when we talk about vulnerabilities, what we could do better. And what two of those individuals, which you will meet because they are now my youth fellows, um, and you'll meet at some point in the near future, what they told me was, we have all these great support um, things on paper, and shout out to Boston um, Public um, Health Commission and Boston Public Schools. We have these things in place, um, but they're not being uh, utilized properly uh, for whatever reason. Um, so I'm a problem solver, and what we decided to do here in MOLA was to create Amplify GSA. And before I get into what Amplify GSA is, um, just to elaborate on why this is so important, there are more than 100, 100 bills in this uh, country that's targeting LGBTQ rights, specifically transgender health. 
as simple as drag shows. Um, people are start trying to stop that. Um, so as Councilor Arroyo said, we want to be celebrated, not tolerated. And I really, truly believe that. And I do think Amplify GSA will bring this. Um, so on March 3rd, we were proud, very, very proud to have 28 young folks with 13 uh, providers, adult providers, who some of them are on this um, call. We were hosted by the Boston Celtics and TD um, Bank, as well as NBC Universal. And it started off as a mentorship day with the Boston Celtics, which turned into something uh, great and purposeful called Amplify GSA. So. Uh, just to tell the people who don't know what uh, Amplify GSA is. So Amplify GSA, Summit. we rebranded it as the Amplify GSA um, Summit because we need to install leadership uh, skills to our young folks so they can, one, know about all the wonderful work that BPS talked about, all the wonderful work that Carmen and uh, Shaq are doing. We just want to really amplify that. So. With this summit will be Boston youth led. We have our two fellows, Eliana Garcia, who you will meet at a later date, and Jovan Williams. Um, Eliana is a student at Fenway um, High, and we have Jovan at Boston Latin Academy. Um, those are two dynamic young people. Um, fortunately, they couldn't make it today because one has a, another part time job and the other did not get permission from his mother. Um, however, they are willing to speak to the council. So I do wanna set something up um, at a later date where you can meet those two and not only those two, but our other 28 young folks that are doing amazing um, work. I do wanna put out to the crowd, when we are talking to young folks, we have to make sure um, one, that they're out um, because a lot of our young folks, and when we talk about safety and public safety and keeping creating safe spaces or brave spaces as our young folks say we have to make sure that they're out to everyone because i'm comfortable talking about um, my sexuality and my past and what i've been through but i'm 41 years old so we have to make um, practice what we preach when we say creating safe spaces so a lot of our young folks that do this work believe it or not they are not out to their immediate family for example they may be out to their mother father but not to their brothers and sisters or the larger family and we know how dangerous that can be so we want to always keep that in mind if we really um, truly believe in keeping these young people safe we have to practice it as well. So solution for that, because I do agree that young folks should be in this space and should talk, but I also straddle that line of keeping everyone safe. So I, I propose um, that we have a meeting with those 28, starting with those 28 and invite as many young people who are willing to have a conversation with city council about their experiences. Um, I also propose that we do this closed doors, not with the cameras or anything like that, because what we did with Boston Celtics, yes, we had a camera because it was documented. We're, docu we're making a documentary, but the thing about um, that platform, people knew it wasn't live. People knew that they can be vulnerable. They could say certain things, um, in front of that group that they couldn't say to their teachers. So I just want to make um, make that suggestion. Um, I'm willing to um, run that um, conversation, facilitate that conversation. We're well versed in that, which leads me to the next solution based thing that uh, MOLA wants to try to um, bring to the table. And that is our LGBTQ uh, plus competency training. We are offering that to all 18,000 employees, but um, I wanna explore what that would look like um, to different organizations, um, teaming up with um, Boston Public uh, Health Commission, as well as Boston Public Schools to see how that training could be holistic and to get to the right people. Um, I wanna just mention the partners that we already have here with um, Amplified GSA. Uh, so our partners, um, as of right now is of course, Boston public schools. We have NBC universal Boston Celtics, queer employee resource group, mass, the Massachusetts trans political coalition, 
Boston Pride for the People, Mass Equality, Mass Commission on LGBT uh, Youth, which is with us today, Chaplay, shout out to Edie Chaplay Brooks, a good, good friend and a good angelic troublemaker in all this work. Um, we have Human Services Chief Maso and Director um, Pedro Cruz, who just started, who will be helping with this as well. So we're super excited about creating these spaces. Something I wanna um, add before uh, we get to the question and answers. Something that we um, picked up or something that the young folks share with us um, in that private conversation of those 28 young folks was that they needed a support system for their parents. So that's something um, that I struggle with um, because I'm so youth driven, so youth focused. Uh, what does it look like to have a support system for parents of LGBTQ plus students. So I really wanna challenge everyone on this phone call today in this hearing to try to invest in that because I think this is just an opinion. I do think that young folks now get queerness and differences, but they struggle because of their parents' um, lack of knowledge. So I'll end there. I, truly believe we should, a uh, weak spot or a blind spot for all of us is uh, parent support. So thank you so much for hosting this hearing. I look forward to all the questions and answers and I do look forward to May 21st at Boston Arts Academy Amplified GSA. It's going to be dynamic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Quincy. I really do appreciate all of your hard work um, and dedication. And, you know, my daughter is, uh, was a member of the, uh, her GSA at school. Um, and, uh, I think it was one of those things that really helped her through a lot of her own, um, questioning, if you will, right. Um, even at 11 and 12 years old. Um, and I think though, just to have a space, um, dedicated, for that, even if it was just in school, really created an opportunity for her to have a sense of community, but more importantly, to build with other young people. Um, and now, as a result of that experience, has learned so much about how she could be a strong ally, right? And I think that those opportunities, starting young, is, is really part of the puzzle too, right? And I really do appreciate um, your call for safety. I think that we make a lot of assumptions about uh, people's comfort level in speaking, just to even have young people speak here publicly. This is a very intimidating forum, right? Which is, you know, especially for someone who's recently just coming out or this is not something that they are accustomed to. So I really do love and appreciate the, um, the guidance around creating space for a more intimate environment where young people can be truly fully expressed. But as, a, as the adults that have been placed in this time in this moment to be here in this space that we know, right, that we're going to utilize our little voices, right, and be the microphone for our young people because we've been out in these streets working alongside them in different capacities so that we can um, walk into this space recognizing that we have an, an opportunity and a responsibility to bring that voice into this space. So, um, so thank you for all of that. I am in the interest of time and I wanna be super mindful because this young person um, has made uh, accommodations to be with us here today remotely um, from Hungary. I think that's how you say it, some other part of the world, some other part of the, you know, hung, Hungary, I think it's Hungary. Um, uh, so Kamani James is no stranger to public hearings. Um, so before we move on to our uh, community panelists and or questions for the administration, I just want to pause because we just need to do a, a, a quick uh, accommodation for someone who uh, we're making space for. And I want to be super mindful of that. So I uh, just wanted to ask my colleagues for a little bit of grace as we just go off script um, so that we can make accommodations to have uh, Kamani James uh, join us uh, for this hearing. Um, so I just wanted to confirm with Ethan or Megan to confirm whether or not uh, Kamani has joined us. Yes. 
Awesome. Okay, great. So, um, Kamani, just like as I mentioned to the rest of the panelists, giving you your five minutes to really uplift kind of what you're, as, as a former BPS, as a recent, like you just graduated and um, not too long ago, uh, as a former BPS student, um, and also as a as a, a member of the school committee and the youth representative uh, in that space, um, I'm really deeply grateful for you answering the call at the last minute to join us today to uplift. So I am going to set the timer and offer you the floor. You now have the floor. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Hello, councillors and those on the call. Um, my name is Kamani James. I graduated from Boston Land Academy in 2021, and I'm currently a sophomore at Columbia University. I want to practice by saying that I have the privilege of hindsight in many ways in regards to this hearing's main focus. Many children are taught to expect bullying in schools, especially during high school, and they're told that they will be bullied for what they wear, how they look, how they talk, walk, etc. I'm sure you can all imagine the rest. The problem is that this is normalized in our culture. Unfortunately, it's normal to go to school and just expect to be bullied for things that are largely out of your control. For people to make assumptions about you from far and act on those assumptions in very harmful ways. But I didn't realize just how backwards this was until I left BPS, how much I had been conditioned into thinking that this was normal. After graduating and leaving Massachusetts, I began traveling a lot and seeing a lot of the world. Um, as Councillor Mejia mentioned, I'm currently in Budapest, Hungary. Um, and traveling the world and going to school at Columbia in New York City and being able to go to Brooklyn every single day and meet with so many different people and interact with so many different and interesting cultures and traditions, it's made me realize the ways in which BPS did me a large disservice in not providing me with the resources that I needed as a Black, queer, feminine man to feel safe and seen. I have been, I've been bullied <laughs> for as early as I remember in my academic career for being an LGBTQ person. And I vividly remember within my first week at my brand new school, Boston Latin Academy, as a ninth grader, that people were already making fun of me and spreading rumors about me because I was queer and feminine. And it hurt a lot. The rest of my high school years, it was riddled um, with, you know, disgusted stares from other kids in the hallways, people openly talking negatively about me um, and the fact that I identified as an LGBTQ plus person. And all of these things made it extremely difficult for me to fully and enthusiastically participate in class, let alone even show up to school. Um, and, you know, sad to say, but I'm going to be honest that when school was locked down in 2020, um, I was actually largely grateful to not have to show up to school in person um, because that meant that I wouldn't have to experience the treatment that I had been experiencing for um, about two and a half years at that point. Um, and it's also the primary reason why even today when people ask me, like, how was high school? You know, people at college would be like, what was your high school like? How was high school? I tell them I hated it. And I'm so glad that I graduated and that I left. I wish I could have liked it, but um, I, I really didn't enjoy it at all. And, you know, in terms of the bullying that I'd face, when I would share or report my experiences to administrators, some would take it seriously by calling the guardians of the people who were bullying me, and in some cases, disciplining them. And there were other times where they wouldn't take it seriously, and they would just tell me, you know, you're strong, all you have to do is ignore them, and they'll stop speaking to sort of the normalized culture of the oppression against LGBTQ plus individuals. We as a society have become largely complacent 
when it comes to how LGBTQ plus people are treated. And the fact is that legislation and policy will only get us so far in this fight against the oppression of LGBTQ plus people. We need to change the way people think. It starts with giving children books to read in school that do not include a heteronormative agenda, but in fact deconstructs that agenda and teaches children that life exists outside of heteronormativity and can actually be very beautiful and fulfilling. It'll teach people that in the long run, you should respect, but also appreciate the differences that people have in the different lives that people live. It starts with training teachers, educators, and anyone else who's interacting with students on a daily basis on how to interact with students and how to make them feel seen in the classroom. Make it clear to those who interact with children that their personal beliefs, specifically in regards to the way people harmlessly live their lives, should never enter the school building. Instead, they should be uplifting children, especially those who don't fit the norm. It starts with changing the way we discipline students who have bullied others for being a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Instead of putting them in detention or giving them some other form of a punitive consequence, try sitting all parties down and turning it into a teaching moment. When I was bullied, especially in high school, not once did I get the chance, the opportunity to sit down with my bully and to offer some words that would enlighten them about the LGBTQ plus community and why it's important that everyone respects and appreciates their differences. And I, ha I believe I have a way with words, so I feel like I could have done a little good back then. It starts with hiring more LGBTQ plus teachers, educators, and staff persons so that students have more people to easily connect with and communicate with. It starts with encouraging those around us, parents and guardians included, to shift their thinking and become more inclusive in all of our ideas and the way we act. I also want to take the time to recognize that there's a lot of rhetoric coming from parents of children who attend schools, many of which are, many of which cite religious or personal beliefs as their reasoning as to not wanting their children to learn about anything related to LGBTQ plus people and the community. And even using that reasoning to justify their children acting in homophobic manners in school, I've seen it myself. And while I know this may be a touchy subject for many people, especially many of you in this call since school districts and politicians often never want to infringe on the rights of um, parents, this does need to be reckoned with. I'd say that the moment a personal belief begins to oppress a person on the basis of who they are and what is intrinsic to their I'm not sure if I froze or if Kamani froze. He was preaching and teaching though. Did I freeze? Was it me? He, he froze, but he was preaching and teaching, though. Oh, he was. I hope we get Kamani back here, because, and, and plus, you know what? Kamani went over his time, you know, went over that time, like, twice already, but um, in the spirit that he, you know, was doing us a favor, I want to make sure that um, we, we allow that extra time. Um, and, yes. Let's... Um, well, you know, Kamani's in Hungary, Budapest, and I don't know sure if, the, if, the <laughs> if there's something happening with, with the internet bootleg situation down there. So um, we'll just keep uh, the conversation. Uh, let's just pin that for now. And when Kamani comes back, um, create space um, to come back into the conversation, whether it be just by dialing. And I'm gonna have Luce, my chief of staff, see if 
Uh, she can work with Megan to see if there's a way to have Kamani call in for any for uh, during the round of questions. Um, so, Luz, if you can call Kamani and let Kamani know that we're going to be working on that, that would be great. Um, in the interest, though, of keeping the conversation going, I think it's only fair for us to move into questions from the administration, for the administration panel. We do have a community panel that's also up next, and I want to make sure that we can bring Kamani back on board um, for, for that line of questioning. So let's just start with the administration panel, and I'm going to lead with our uh, the lead sponsor of this hearing order, Councilor Lara. You now have the floor and uh, five minutes. Thank you, Councilor Mejia, and uh, thank you so much for, to the administration, to the folks who are here for sharing uh, what BPS is doing. I just want to echo what Councilor Arroyo lifted up in terms of trying to figure out where the pain points are. Um, I, it's not lost on me that you're doing an incredible amount of work and that you're, you know, really trying to combat what you're seeing out in the world and make sure that BPS uh, doesn't become one of those school systems that is in the news for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, and I know that you need more support and you need more resources and you need to expand the level of support that you're giving. And so I would really love if we could really um, dive into that. Uh, I think in part of what we heard about one, having young people here, uh, I invite the opportunity to meet with young people. And also I am weary of having the experience of young queer people who are part of BPS filtered towards, like through the administration and BPS's lens, um, which is, was my hope that we could get young people who were part of BPS here to be a part of the community panel that were not connected to the administration. Uh, and so obviously there is no harm in having a meeting with a group of 28 queer young people to hear their experiences, uh, I do think that particularly when we're talking, you know, and, and this might get this might be a little a little heady and a little theoretic <laughs> uh, in the sense, but when we're talking about queering, you know, queerness uh, is inherently living outside of systems, and so I would, you know, I think that it's it's important um, for me to to kind of invite that perspective outside that is infiltrated through the lens of of either BPS or the administration. So um, my yearning to have young people here was guided by that. Um, <laughs> uh, not that I would love to talk to young people. So I have questions about what currently exists. So there is a young person in middle school, assuming elementary school, I would love to hear how young you are seeing in BPS that you're seeing that young people are coming out. Uh, I think that that would be an important piece of information, but let's just say later in elementary school, maybe middle school, maybe high school, wherever you're seeing it, you have a student that maybe comes out to a teacher, maybe doesn't come out at home. What happens? What is available? What does that look like in the trajectory of a student inside of BPS? I'm going to invite our LGBTQ plus student support manager, Carmen Fonseca, to speak about some of the, the ways that she is supporting young people at all age levels in the Boston Public Schools and that type of situation. And then we'll see if Danielle wants to add anything as well. Go yeah, ahead. Becky, could, could I have you, Becky, um, uh, and, and can you just kind of as, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I'm not sure if, uh, if if Carmen is still with us, but like uh, I don't, I don't think I see her on my panel here. Yeah, she's so, here. But she is. Um, I didn't, I didn't think she was here for some reason. And Danielle is here. both Karen and Danielle are here. Carmen. Okay. And well, okay. Are both okay. Here. okay. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Go ahead, Carmen. Um. So. I appreciate the question. Um, students come to us in all sorts of ways. Um, there's definitely schools that have more capacity or more um, competence or specific staff people um, that students feel comfortable going to who might never end up interacting with me because kind of the school has it from, um, from their end. There's a lot of times as, as folks were saying that um, students come out and um, staff or maybe it's the first student that um, has come out to them or maybe it's the um, their first time interacting with an LGBTQ plus student and they're less familiar with some of the resources that are available or the best way to support them. So I got a lot of questions around just like, you know, exactly what you were saying, like this first grader um, just came out, uh, not totally sure what to do. They mentioned that 
Um, you know, sometimes uh, family is unaware or they don't feel supported at home. So it's really about the individual student and what would be helpful to them. Um, the first thing that um, I, I think I can speak for um, all of the BPS folks on the call, but the first thing that we really say is, have you talked to the student about what they think would feel supportive to them? Because, you know, as, as folks were saying, we do a lot of filtering through our, our adult brains, through our administrative brains and in various different ways. And, and also every, every child is gonna be different. Every student is gonna be different in terms of what feels supportive to them. So we really start from there. And um, just for example, if they share that they don't necessarily feel supported at home, but it doesn't feel like a safety issue. It's more of just like a nobody teaches you how to come out to your parents, especially as um, as a as a young person. Um, so it could be, you know, having a conversation with whoever their trusted adult within the school is about what might feel helpful to them what resources we can connect them to, um, if they, they feel comfortable with us connecting parents to resources, as, as Quincy was mentioning, uh, making sure that uh, families and caregivers are really involved as much as possible and making sure that they have uh, supports as well. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, Danielle, I would love for you to share some, but I'm over time already. And so I'm gonna ask for more concise answers from you if I can, because I am on a timer. Um, so what, level of training do teachers receive to be responsive to that? So it seems like right now what happens is that if a, you know, a student comes out to a teacher, a teacher is kind of going to either um, Carmen or somebody else to kind of say, hey, I'm not really sure. Maybe like you said, it's the first time that it's happened. So what kind of training are teachers receiving to prepare them um, for what I'm sure, because young people are feeling more comfortable coming out is happening more and more often at schools. Um, so how are we preparing them for that? Um, is that something you want me to answer, Councilor? I would love anybody who can sure. answer. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in the district for several years, we've had some training opportunities through the Health and Wellness Office with the Safe Schools training that they had piloted. So many people that have been in the district for a while, um, we've engaged in those trainings over years. Uh, I've been a GSA advisor for all 22 years of my time at um, in Boston Public Schools at a couple different schools. Uh, and so, you know, in years past, um, we've worked with organizations that have done some training um, and support for GSA advisors. Um, so there's definitely some very specific, you know, skill building things for GSA advisors to learn, you know, really locally in BPS about our policies and how we support kids and kind of best practices. Like Carmen said, obviously centering the student, you know, really taking their lead um, and, being the connector for supports, you know, beyond that, not over promising, not um, assuming, you know, what's, you know, the student's home life is like, but really taking it at their pace. Um, and then there's oftentimes, sorry. They're not mandatory. They're just available and people can take Well, them. both. It's both. So some of them are um, voluntary if you're really looking to dive in, but a lot of schools have had some mandatory PD in the past several years. And I can say in a previous role, that was things that I myself did coming out to schools. I know Carmen's done some of that work, um, but there have been many school-based mandatory trainings to at least make sure that everybody in the building had very, had kind of the basics. You know, that outing students knows, is knows how to respond to a young right, person. knows how to respond, exactly. And that well, knows how to connect them to training. Exactly. And that was made her part of their professional development that everybody in the school engaged in. Um, so that work has been um, done there too. If if it's okay just to give a follow-up, you know, you had asked kind of that leaning in vulnerability. I think when we're thinking about adults in these spaces, teachers are really, you know, overtapped right now with a lot of things. So for teachers to have time and resources to further engage in that work, I think would be great. And truly, especially GSA advisors, because they are doing a unique role in their school. So when, you know, if you're asking for kind of what we need, I, I can tell you from doing a lot of work in the past 22 years with other GSA advisors, they need time and support. Um, and there's lots of turnover and people have a lot on their plates. And so new folks step into those roles. We need to keep that support network going for GSA advisors, and that's a place I'm glad to hear that the Amplified GSA um, event's coming up. I'm really excited for that. I ran a GSA summit for years in the district too, so um, Ms. Roberts, I'm happy to extend any support I can, but we tried to do a track there for GSA advisors as well as for the students. So when folks got together, there was a mutual level of support, and that work began even before I came into that role. There were teachers doing that work too. Thank you, um, Danielle. And you know, in the spirit of, and then Councilor Mejia, I hear my, I hear my alarm. I, I'm not ignoring it. <laughs> um, yes, in, you are. Oops, you know, in the spirit of Kamani's statement around changing people's minds, 
what is available for uh, students? What does the curriculum look like? Are you showing, are, are you teaching queer history? Is there age appropriate sex ed at BPS schools that focuses on gender and sexuality? What is being made available to our students? to support them and not only understanding how to support their peers, uh, but under, uh, you know, just general understanding of being good, empathetic humans in the world. And I, I just want to be, speak before you guys uh, answer, I just want to note that Kamani has rejoined us. And before I continue with the line of questions with my colleagues, I'm going to go back to Kamani because Kamani is on a timer. Um, and so I wanted to just be mindful, just giving my colleagues a heads up that after Counselor Lada, we're going to go back to Kamani. For, um, so they can finish up. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, this is, my, this is my last question. I'll leave some for another round. I'm going to ask Jill Carter to speak about our sexual health education curriculum. Sure. Thanks, Becky. Um, as I mentioned in our opening remarks, um, our, our sexual health education curriculum, uh, which is uh, rights, respect, and responsibility, um, definitely is, uh, you know, fully inclusive of LGBTQ plus students. And I can say some more about specifics about what that means, um, but I, I just wanted to highlight that. And, and we've been using and training on that curriculum for quite a long time. Um, so anyway, I, I appreciate the need for brief um, responses, but I'm happy to say any more about that. Yeah, and, and I think Danielle could speak to the other part of your question, Councilor Lara, around broader curriculum. Yeah, that's something that we've been working on, I think, for the past several years. Um, I know the state had done some really strong work on developing curriculum modules in English and history and even in math and sciences. Um, I know as an educator, we've been really excited and hopeful about those modules. They've never, I think, finished that process of, of being developed and released on the state level. So I would say if that work is still happening, I think it was happening actually originally through the Legislative Commission on LGBTQ youth. Um, I know like Arthur Lipkin had come out and met with me on many occasions about that. And there was kind of in that process, I'll tell you as a, a teacher, I'm ready for it and excited. And we did a lot of preliminary work for teachers who are really excited about it, but I'll push into that as another area of support. I'd love for that to be something that the state continued developing and rolling out. And I know there's people here ready to do it too. We certainly do it, you know, I'll say at our own school, great support from teachers in the science all the way through the humanities, but I'd love to have something that comes from the state level that really helps guide that work. So kids are getting common experiences around some of, you know, the great leaders and the moments. I know as a queer person myself, centering myself in history and books was the first time I felt seen as a teenager when I felt invisible and to be able to say, oh, here's my culture. Here's a history that I just didn't know about. That didn't come until I was in my 20s and found it myself. So I want to make sure that we can help kids connect with that at this age. And I'd love support. Um, I know lots of teachers would love to work on that too. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lada. I'll, I will go back for a second round of questions. So, but I just want to, in the interest of time, just make sure that we bring back Kamani into the space. I believe that we have fixed the internet in Hungary and everything is back in working order. So Kamani, um, you said you had a few more um, points that you wanted to share and want to make sure that you have the space to do so. Thank you, Councilor Mejia, and apologies to everyone for the internet cutting out. It's been a constant issue here. Um, I hope that the points that I brought up earlier are still fresh in everyone's minds. Um, I only need about 20 seconds to conclude, and I do plan to stick around just in case anyone has any questions for me. Um, but, you know, I, I was speaking about the quote unquote, personal or religious beliefs that many parents cite as to why they don't want their children in schools learning about anything related to LGBTQ plus people or the community, rather than whether that be history or contemporary studies. And this reasoning is also often used as a justification as to why their children are um, you know, sort of justified in going to school and being homophobic towards other students, other children. And I wanted to say that a personal belief begins to oppress a person on the basis of who they are and what is intrinsic to their identity. And when it gets to that point, it has no space in any classroom, any school or any school district. It must be eradicated. Children in school do not remain children in school forever. 
They grow up to be people who shape the social fabric of our society. So it is imperative that we only teach them values and ideas that will inevitably promote the good later down the line. And in order for people to feel comfortable and seen and safe, it's going to take a ton of work, transformative, revolutionary work, work that will inevitably get some people mad. But the most transformative work over the centuries have always gotten people mad, but it has ultimately done good. That's how I wanted to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, and it's so worth getting you back into the space. Really do appreciate your leadership, um, and we're all better for your participation here today. I, I, and I'm also grateful that you are able to uh, accommodate uh, being able to stay for some more questions. Uh, so thank you, um, Kamani. We really do appreciate you. I am going to move on. Um, I have lots of questions, but I am going to, in the spirit of making sure that my colleagues um, have have an opportunity to ask questions as well. I'm going to hold mine off for a while. So I'm going to go to Councilor, Council President uh, Flynn, uh, followed by Councilor Murphy, then um, Councilor Anderson, if she's around. I understand that Councilor Arroyo does not have any questions, and uh, then Councilor Louisian. That's the order. So Councilor Flynn, you now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the panel for the important work you're doing. Maybe my question is to the BPS team and or Quincy as well. Um, what type of support is BPS providing LGBTQ high school students after school programs, whether it's sports or it's, um, it's various groups or um, <clears throat> meetings or discussions or or um, academic work or any any type of any type of assistance is it is it structured in a way that it's BPS wide or is it up to the the leader of the particular high school? I'm going to ask Danielle Murray to respond to that question. I, I want to note that there seems to be a technical problem where um, Carmen Fonseca is currently not in the Zoom as a panelist, so we're trying to fix that. But in the meantime, I know that Danielle has a lot of experience with the answer to that question. Um, thank you for that question. I think that's um, an important you know, piece of the work that we do when we're supporting LGBTQ youth is in their after-school involvement. We know a lot of kids feel really connected to the community through their after-school engagement. So I think it really varies, on, not just from school to school, but really student to student, right? A lot of our kids are really involved in, in athletics in the plays and music programs and just clubs in general. So there's a, a wide variety of experiences in terms of like after school involvement. In terms of our GSAs, um, they're really run uh, school by school. It can look really differently. Some are done during the day, during lunch times, or like some people have like flexible blocks in their school schedule. So I know at our school, we have like a W block. So we may hold some you know specific programming during an in-school time that students are able to choose what they do. Um, most GSAs have programming after school but again, it can vary from school to school. At our particular school, we have a weekly GSA meeting, um, sorry, a bi-weekly GSA meeting. And then on the alternate works, we have a GSA study space. So there's some academic support. We have like older tutors um, in the LGBTQ community who tutor some of our middle school and younger students. Um, and so it's some kids are there just kind of working on homework in a space where they feel really comfortable and can connect with peers and see some of the older kids and like what they're going through kind of a it's get better it gets better model you know in school um, that's been really successful we uh, piloted it this year i will say we have some great partners in boston that we also work with after school like a lot of our students attend programming at boston glass or bagley those are two lgbtq um, community programs in the city um, and so over the years we've partnered with them too for different um, after school events and even you know community gsa events too uh, but there is there's not really one set way a GSA should run after school. I think um, it depends on the age of the kids, the needs of the kids, and um, what they're balancing. So we've moved to in-school models in some of my previous schools. Like during the day, that's what kids need. Sometimes there are like lunch bunches once a week, as well as an after-school meeting. So it is pretty flexible, but the outside partners like Boston Glass and Bagley are a big part of places where kids um, connect, and there's some great 
you know, events as well as supports in those places too. And Thank Danielle, you. I just want, uh, Councilor Flynn, I just wanted to add to uh, what Danielle said. Amplify GSA in one of those tracks is a leadership track. It's called Leaders of the New School. And in that track, uh, the young folks will learn how to put a GSA together. So whether it's an after school, what that looks like during school, what that looks like, and summer. Um, I never even really thought about a summer GSA and what that looks like. So thanks for putting that in the atmosphere. Just wanted to add. Thank you, thank you, Danielle, and thank you, Quincy. And I guess, I guess my final question, maybe, maybe to Quincy. Um, Quincy, I know, as I mentioned in my opening statement, bridge over troubled waters, break time. They're doing, they're doing excellent work for um, LGBTQ youth, young people. Um, are, are you tracking, um, are you tracking hate crimes or? or violence against the um, LGBTQ community in Boston, but especially especially the um, young people. In what what are you seeing based on some of the studies that you've been um, you've been working on? Got it. Um, so yes, to answer your question, we are tracking LGBTQ plus hate crimes. Um, that's being ran by uh, Deputy Superintendent Richard Dayhill at the Boston Police. Um, he has a monthly. Um, public safety meeting, everyone's open, that meeting's open to everyone, constituents, uh, politicians, doesn't matter. And in that meeting, we talk about what's going on. The FBI is present as well, SBI is present along with mass equality. So now mass equality, I'm not sure if they're on the call, mass equality and what um, Director Brooks, should play Brooks does, they can give you a little bit more information about when it's uh, youth specific because we get a holistic uh, report on that monthly. Um, um, but I do know Mass Equality and Massachusetts LGBT Youth Commission, they have uh, better data on young folks. Um, so I will yield my time and hopefully that gets answered when um, E.D. Brooks speaks. Yeah, yes, Quincy, it does. Th thank you for the answer. Thank you, Danielle, for, for your answer. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Flynn, I was about to say you're doing really great and good job. I'm going to give your extra time to someone else. Um, I'm going to go next to Councillor Murphy. You now have the floor. Councillor Murphy, are you still with us? Three, two, one. I am going to move on. Councilor Murphy, if you are with us and you come back, I will make sure that we go to you for questions. I'm going to move on um, to Councilor Anderson. I know you were going to be stepping in and out, so not sure if you're with us. If you are, more than happy to uh, bring you in for questions. Three, two, one. Moving on. I am going to go next to Councillor Louise Jen. If you're here, you now have the floor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair. And just want to thank the administration for being here. Um, I want to thank Kamani for um, their words as well. I there are some just like want to just give flowers to all the folks who are doing incredible work to push this issue forward. I mean, really be responsive to the needs of our LGBTQIA students in our schools. Um, the, my first question is, do we as a city, as BPS, do we track the demographic data of um, how our staff and teachers, whether they identify um, as LGBTQIA, both staff and um, students, and do we have that data? But both staff and teachers, and do we have that data? Yeah, um, we don't ask our employees to self-identify their sexual identity um, because we want to um, create an environment where they're free to be open uh, in whatever ways they choose rather than compelling them to do that as employees. However, um, both the central office offers an affinity group for our employees who choose to attend to identify as LGBTQ. And there's also a similar group that's met over the years 
through the Boston Teachers Union, and we've had some um, collaboration between those two. Um, I, there was a particularly memorable gay pride event um, a few years ago where both the, uh, all three, the central office group, the BTU group, and uh, numerous GSAs came together for a big BPS contingent in, in pride. So we try to make sure to offer safe and brave um, spaces for students, for staff, and also for families, because we do have families um, with two moms or with two dads or with um, a trans parent, a gender non-binary parent who also need supports. And that's come up a little bit um, in our conversation today. Um, in particular, a few years ago, um, we ran a program through Parent University that probably a lot of you are familiar with, where we offered that space to families, both um, LGBTQ plus parents, as well as parents of LGBTQ plus kids to bring people together for support. Um, so that's another important part of the work is the grown ups. Yeah, I think, thank you, Becky. I think it's, a, I think it's incredibly important. I wonder if, you know, um, oftentimes there, we have these surveys and, and folks can choose not to answer, but I, I wonder if there's value in us trying to collect that information on the front end. Because if, as I believe it was Jill, we were talking about how important school connectedness is to our, to our young folks, but you know, you know, um, did you guys students having, um, not faring as well academically because of that lack of school connectedness we know that, for example, with black and brown students, one of the things that we, to improve outcomes, you get more black and brown teachers. Potentially the same is true with LGBTQI students, right? Let's get more students and more staff in the door um, and sort of knowing sort of what the numbers are now will help us figure out where we need to get to. So just, you know, I, I think it's incredibly important to, to collect data around what is and what isn't. Some people think that by not collecting data, that's one way of addressing the problem, sort of we're being like, we're being like race blind or we're being LGBTQIA blind, but actually we got to address the problem head on. And so I, I encourage us to collect that data so that we're able to um, see where we're falling short. Um, second question I had was, I, I think it was you as well, Jill, I know Quincy and his team at MOLA have been doing some incredible work uh, on the jet with uh, gender and sexualities alliances and really trying to improve what those look like in our schools and give the support necessary. So that about 75 schools have GSAs and 20 have reached out for more assistance. What does the assistance look like currently? What is the framework for assistance right now for our genders and sexualities uh, alliances? We as city council are about to be nose deep in uh, the budget review process. And I think these are questions for us to elevate if we believe that our GSAs need more support, need more financial support, need more um, bodies that are really dedicating their time and attention to this issue and to this issue specifically in conjunction with MOLA. So just wanted to get some more, some more uh, just data around our, uh, around our GSAs and what the support systems currently look like for them. Sure. I think I um, spoke about this a little bit before you were able to join us, Counselor. Um, I'm sorry if, that's, have, if I'm that's okay. putting you on yeah. repeat and rewind. Yeah. No problem. Um, we do have um, someone who's part of our team, um, Shaq Jones, who unfortunately is out of the country today and unable to join us, but um, his role is entirely focused on supporting our GSAs. We also have par external partners, some of whom have already been mentioned today, who are um, supporting GSAs as well. And I think some of them have been around a long time and have sort of um, traditions and their own culture as an organization and, and don't feel a particular need for extra support. But I do want to give um, Danielle a chance to add because she's got the long view as well as the immediate view as a current GSA advisor. Um, and do I still have time to add? Um, I'll just echo what Becky said about um, Shaq's work and um, you know, that we've always had somebody in the health and wellness office, uh, even in my earlier times, who would come out and support GSAs. Uh, we worked really closely together in the past, you know, going out and seeing what the needs are. Like I said, they're really so diverse, dependent on um, the school community. So having somebody that really gets to know the kids and knows the school community can be really helpful in helping design um, the best GSA. You know, um, I'm excited uh, for Quincy's work with Amplify GSAs too, and excited to have um, some connections as a GSA advisor. I'm excited to connect um, with the mayor's office as well. Uh, and I know Glisten, Massachusetts uh, has a lot of work around GSA formation. Glisten National too. Um, I know we use their resources a lot. Can, can I just chime in because we're, you were talking about sort of resources and financial. Um, the funding that we use to support um, SHAC 
um, as our GSI, GSA coordinator, and additional, some of the programming supports comes from um, a federal grant that we have from the office. So I think as you're thinking about sort of supporting the district and Becky's team um, to continue the work, you know, we anticipate hopefully being able to keep that grant. Um, we have it for one more year and then we'll reapply. But I think being able to sustain um, and expand any internal, it's really important to have GSA support in the, con, you know, in all places like Danielle said, like in the community, in everywhere, but I think wanting to make sure that we can keep um, Shaq's role strong and firmly funded, I would just put that one up as a place that could could use some additional support at some point. Thank you. And, and oh, Thank you. Chair, do I have a do I have a no. time for for one no. more? I mean, yeah, you were out of time like a minute and a half ago, so I was just being grace, uh, graceful. So you can ask one more. Okay, um, so the kind so through the chair, I'd actually love to know, and maybe Quincy, I don't know, can get it. This I'd love to have an idea to know what are the 75 schools that have GSAs. I'd love to know the 20 schools that have reached out for more assistance who they are, because I wonder if there's, um, I wonder if there's similarities between those schools, right? Like, do they have better access? Are they better organized? Like, just because folks are reaching out doesn't mean that the ones that aren't, aren't reaching out need support. And then can we find, are there similarities between the schools that don't have GSAs? Because, right, like maybe we should be doing yes. a little bit more hand-holding, yes. right? Yes. With those who yes. can't put out their hands, let's do more hand-holding with those who aren't reaching out. And then there's, I think Kamani spoke to this and so many people spoke to the need for us to really be helping families. Um, who have their students who are coming out, uh, their children who are coming out, um, families that have children who are engaged in bullying. Uh, there's been a lot of effort put behind our family liaisons who already have so much on our plate because our students are going through an unprecedented mental health crisis that often stems from their homes that are and families and parents that are going through mental health challenges. So I'm remiss to put more on the plates of family liaisons, but I do think that there's room for us to think creatively about family liaisons and their work with MOLA and their work with really being part of the support system for our LGBTQIA students and more LGBTQIA understanding in our schools. Um, and maybe that comes in the forms of like, maybe th the end result is probably where we need to be already is that we should be having more family liaisons in our schools and one particularly that's working along the lines of creating more inclusivity and affinity in our school system. So just putting that, throwing that out there as an idea, because I think that that is the role of our family liaisons, but they may already be too stretched and overworked in this burnout. So just putting those out as ideas. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair, for indulging me. And I see Quincy coming on. Yes, uh, real quick. I know we're running out of time, but thanks for all those points. And I just wanted to add on what everybody's saying. Those Out of those 20 schools, seven of those schools, and including an additional middle school, Hurley school, apply for the Beyond Pride mini grants. Um, and they said explicitly that they needed more resources to do X, Y, and Z. So after this hearing, I would love to talk to all the counselors about the data that we currently have on those seven schools and why they uh, felt the need to apply for or more resources. So I just wanted to add that because there are schools with a plethora of resources like Boston Arts Academy, but they still apply for resources because they feel like they need more. So let's look into that and what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then and just in the process of just um, because we have a few of our colleagues that are no longer here, just wanted to make sure that if anyone um, from the administration wants to answer the questions in regards to uh, the schools, the 70 schools, I believe, um, a question that Councilor Luigian asked, if you want to go on the record and, and answer that, I'd love to, you know, get that on the record now. Yeah, I, I can stab, take a stab at it from MOLA's standpoint. That's half of the reason why we are on this tour, which um, I'll tell you all about. I think we submitted our PowerPoint. That should be in the PowerPoint. If not, um, we can talk about it offline. But we are trying to visit all the schools that are protected under Massachusetts general law. So we have been to 10 thus far, so we have a long ways to go. So. Um, just want to let you know that we are trying to get to all the schools and see, do an assessment of what they need and what resources mean to them. Because a lot of schools, they say resources and it might not be money. It might just be a more robust training for the staff. So, and yeah. Becky, I'm sure you have 
Yeah, uh, and I'll give, if Danielle wants that, she's welcome, but I would say there would be a wide variety of reasons why a particular school might not have a GSA. For example, we have a number of early education centers that are for our very, very little ones um, that where a GSA would not likely to be an appropriate format, um, but where we do want to have some wonderful books in their libraries that are affirming of their what their family looks like and of their what their eventual identities may evolve into. Um, and we've done some great work with our libraries team on that. Um, so it, there'll be a variety of reasons why a particular school might not have one. But of course, if there's any school that would, has a need for a GSA and a desire and hasn't yet had one, um, that's what Shaq's work is all about and, and Carmen's work as well. So we stand ready um, if we identify a single school that it, where a GSA would meet our students' needs, we wanna be part of making that happen. Do you wanna add anything, Danielle? I think just that your point is well taken about some of the younger schools. They might have ally clubs or, you know, things that are around like being a good friend and empathy building. They might not fall exactly under the GSA umbrella, but that it's, you know, family diversity clubs that's getting to some of the same messages, but might not follow, you know, exactly under what a gender sexuality alliance is. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, Councilor Louisiane, for asking those really great questions and getting us to really think outside the box in terms of how we can meet this moment. I'll just, uh, unless uh, Councilor Murphy or Councilor Flynn surface up here, I'm going to go now to my questions, all right? Um, so I've been patiently waiting. Um, I would love to just know, uh, Becky, uh, in terms of your staffing and your diversity, I don't see any men of color here, so I'm just curious whether or not BPS uh, in, in the your Office of Equity, especially specifically around LGBTQ+, what's that staffing look like? Yeah, so in terms of our staff, we have um, there, we have two, we have Carmen Fonseca, um, who identifies as a person of color. We have Amina Awad, who's our social work intern, also identifies as a person of color. And Shaq, who we've been um, lauding in this conversation, who's part of the Office of Health and Wellness, is a man of color. Great, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. The reason why I ask around representation, um, and it's not just uh, race, it's also gender. Um, and uh, I would love to just advocate that as you continue to think about your staffing model and you continue to think about LGBTQ+, plus, that we're also thinking about trans um, and making sure that we are, if the whole goal is for young people to see themselves, to see all of themselves, that I, I would love to see that as part of one of the goals that we work towards in um, affirming that so just wanted to yeah that and I, I will say it's always looking at our whole team in the office of equity it does include individuals who identify as trans and gender non-binary that's great i'm happy to hear that um and I, the next time i would invite them to be a part of our conversations in, in, in this particular forum it would be great to kind of hear that perspective and insight in, in navigating both our staff and also just maybe kind of the type of relationships that they have been able to build with young people. I just think that that is key. Um, and I think that we learn and, and are able to move differently when we hear differently. So I just wanted to uplift that. I'm gonna move on to a next question. It's still within the line of equity and race and representation. Let's just talk a little bit about cultural competency. Um, as we think about LGBTQ youth, um, we know in communities of color in particular, there's a lot of stigma around just being out. And I'm just curious in terms of what the what the district is doing. I think, you know, Kamani said something that was really powerful in terms of a lot of the stuff is not just policy or or money. It really is a it's a mind shift and it's a it's a lot of it is cultural, um, even within our own staff, right? Like we make assumptions. Uh, we talk about, you know, what about your mom and dad making assumptions that the household um, is uh, you have a mom and a dad. You could have two moms, you can have two dads. Like, so I just really want to be mindful that as we continue to have these conversations, then some of it is not going to be regulated through policy or uh, or protocol or procedures about training people to be more affirming um, and then holding ourselves accountable to that, right? So to have some systems in place when people are not showing up in that way, right? I think that the accountability piece is usually where we get lost. And I think that I would recommend and offer, there's a way for us to figure out how we can support staff in being more affirming and then not only supporting them, but holding them accountable 
to what it looks like when they aren't affirming, that that has to also be a part of the conversation because otherwise people are just going to continue to show up as they are. And that's not acceptable for our kids. So I just Absolutely. wanted to hear your reactions around that. Yeah, I mean, the, the thought that comes right to mind, Counselor, is um, the fact that in the Office of Equity, as you know, part of our responsibility is to address bias based incidents involving staff. And we have had some staff who have not been fully respectful of our students, um, either misgendering students or making it clear that they are not making a deliberate effort to remember the student's affirming name. And when that occurs, we hold them accountable just in the exact same way we would for any other form of oppression that a staff member might engage in. And we know when we do that, not only are we holding that individual educator accountable to um, respect that student's identity, but we are also sending a message more broadly because while we do try to keep our work confidential in the Office of Equity, we know that human beings tend to talk about what happened? They hear, hey, what? That teacher got in trouble because they refused to use the accurate pronouns for that student? Yeah, they did, because that is part of creating a welcoming and affirming environment for children. So um, it it's, has a double benefit to not only get that teacher on the right track, but also to send a broader message that this is an expectation in the Boston Public Schools. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know that, Quincy, you have your hand up. I'm going to go to you next, and then I have a yeah. follow-up question. Okay. Um, just a quick plug. Um, the goal of uh, MOLA is to make sure that the LGBTQ plus competency training is treated just like the ra racial equity training. We want that to be mandatory. Of course, it's a pilot now starting uh, April 1st with three departments, but the end goal, and that's where um, the council, the mayor come in, we want this to be mandatory because I think Councilor Laura said earlier, like what's happening before someone even takes a job? And that's where that's right. my mind goes. It's like before they even on board to be a BPS teacher or staff or whatever the case may be, they should be having this training to know that don't touch the stove because it's hot. So let's be more proactive than reactive and stop waiting to a teacher misgender someone and get them right in the beginning of the year or summer or however those trainings are um, disseminated. So I will add that MOLA is more than willing. We have the training already prepared, so we're more than willing to be the facilitators of that in partnership with what um, Boston Public Schools already have. Thank you. I love that. I love that. And Jill, I see your hand up. I do have a follow-up, but I'm going to go to you next and then I have my follow-up. Okay, so you want, it's okay for me? Yeah, 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 yeah go ahead, yeah, absolutely. I was just gonna chime in that, um, you know, the Office of Health and Wellness, uh, one of our teams is around, um, is focused on social emotional learning. And and I, I heard uh, Kamani, you know, talking earlier about this idea of the norms in schools and this accepting um, nature of, you know, just around bullying. And I, I really believe that our approach to transformative social emotional learning is is really about creating a climate where uh, teachers and students have to co-create um, a relationships that are strong and respectful. And so through transformative cell, we are focused a lot on training adults, adult cell if you will, is one of the key p strategies that we work on, which is so that teachers have to build their own self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and decision-making skills. They have to reflect on those and then learn and think about how that connects to, how does that give them the skills to relate to their students and build strong, um, you know, those strong um, learning experiences in safe, and welcoming environments. So I just wanted to highlight that that's like another, it's a strategy that is connected to, I think what we're talking about today. Yeah. And it's a lot of focus on adults, so. Thank you, Joe. And I want to just be super mindful of time. And I have one more question and I'm going to ask my colleagues if you do have a second round of questions or one more question for the administration panel before we move on, just to raise your hand so that I could be mindful of that. But um, I wanted to just, uh, I wanted to quickly follow up on, on some of the, the conversations that we're having in regards to just the adults in, in the space and the accountability. I'm gonna go back to accountability. I'm always gonna be about like accountability, right? Because we can put all of these things in place, but if we don't put in 
the infrastructure for how do we know that we are successful, then it's just a whole bunch of beautiful words on paper. So I'm going to ask, um, where is the baseline? Are we starting from a place of understanding the attitudes that the, uh, the adults that are in front of our kiddos bring to the table? Is there an attitudes uh, uh, quiz, if you will, or some sort of understanding of how people perceive LGBTQ plus youth to begin with? right, as, as, as part of the onboarding process, because I'd like to know where people are at even before they come in. And then after they go through a training, right, are they equipped to continue to, you know, be in front of our young people? So I'm curious about what types of mechanisms BPS has in place to hold yourself accountable to uh, gender affirming and LGBTQ affirming personnel uh, tactics. Like, can you just talk to me about what that looks like? That's a lot, Share a little but. bit, and then I'll see if um, Danielle wants to add. But um, the Office of Equity has been very much involved with what we do to train our hiring committees in the district, both for school-based positions as well as for central office positions. Um, and in partnership with the Office of Human Capital um, and the recruitment team in particular, we have a um, what's the right word. Um, a directory, I have a better word, but anyway, a directory of cultural competence questions for to use during the interviewing process. I would say that our number one focus is on culturally sustaining practices, whether our educators, whether our family liaisons, our school administrators, our central office team leaders have a deep understanding of our communities of color, that is definitely our highest priority. But we also are encouraging schools and central office departments to be thinking about other areas of competence. Are we prepared to well support our LGBTQ plus students? Are we aware of what it means to be an excellent ally to a Muslim student or a Jewish student? Are we ready for students with a wide range of disabilities, even if we're not a special education department member or a special education teacher? Um, so I absolutely agree with you, Counselor, that we need to be thinking about this on the way in. And over time, I think questions about um, how to support our LGBTQ plus students are gonna become even more important as we continue to see the proportion of our students who identify that way growing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I, I want to be mindful that um, we do have a second panel and I see that Counselor Lara, I believe is the only person that has asked for a second round of questions. So I will go to you and then we'll transition over to the community panel. And I'm going to ask BPS to, uh, if you can, to, to not go anywhere. Thank you, Counselor Lara. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia, and thank you all for your answers to your questions. I'm incredibly insightful, and I'm just really grateful for the incredible amount of work that you're doing. I know it's really difficult. Um, and it's also been helpful to see, like I said, kind of where the gaps are and how we can be supportive. So that's so thank you um, for saying yes to Councillor Mejia's invitation to be vulnerable. <laughs> um, my question is, I, I just have one last question. When, um, Jill, you were talking about the YSRB survey, you talked about how students that self-identified as being a part of the LGBTQ community also were more likely to respond to the question about their grades being Cs, Ds, or Fs. And so I think that there's some indication there that queer students in BPS are also struggling um, academically. I know that obviously your, your academic supports are not targeted, but I'm curious about what academic supports look like in schools right now. And um, are they, I wouldn't say tailored, but are, you know, are they sensitive to kind of like this demographic and how do you kind of target? students that need more of that academic support. And I'd like to encourage Kamani uh, James to also be a part of the answering panel for this one, just because Kamani has recently graduated from BPS and can talk a little bit about that journey. So Kamani, since you're still in the space, please uh, feel free to also answer that question if you feel the need to. But Becky, you can start first. I was going to defer to Kamani, <laughs> uh, but I'll speak for a moment. And it's great to see you, by the way, Kamani. Um, 
So uh, I, I love the model that Danielle shared earlier around creating a space that's specifically focused on our LGBTQ plus kids to get those academic supports. And I, I know it's a pilot at the moment, but it's one that I fully expect is going to be very successful and look forward to scaling to the district um, and sharing that model with other schools. Um, I think, you know, our, our kids overall are struggling right now. We see signs of this in all kinds of ways, including that they're struggling academically. And this is particularly true for our LGBTQ plus students, and it's particularly true for our Black and Latinx students. It's particularly true for our low income students. We, it's particularly true for our English learners, for our, our um, students with disabilities. And the more intersectionality there is, and if you have a student who's a member of most of those or even two of those um, identities and experiences, um, we're seeing all kinds of um, indications of struggle. And I truly believe that if we can stay true to our current focus as a district on the superintendent's priorities regarding imp improving the quality of instruction, regarding having the availability of social workers for every student to get that form of, of support, um, having family liaisons so that we know what's uh, more about what's happening at home that can help to support academic flourishing. These, these broader interventions will have a disproportionate benefit to our kids who need them most. That's the idea. The idea is to focus those supports on our highest need students, and that includes our LGBTQ plus students. Danielle, do you want to add anything? And then we'll see what Kamani would like to add. Um, just quickly, I'd, you know, again, I agree with that. I think some of those curriculum modules and helping folks, you know, see themselves in the curriculum are always ways that are going to help not only bring kids in, but, you know, that window, those mirrors, doors, you know, letting kids see themselves, not only for our LGBTQ kids, but letting everybody see the richness that this culture and community has contributed um, to history, too. Um, that would be really helpful, too. So uh, I did, if it's okay, just for two seconds, I wanted to just make a point about um, Councilor Mejia's question around hiring. Um, I think, you know, we have some language in our hiring documents too about seeing LGBTQ folks as an asset. And so it's not necessarily a numbers issue, but also saying that this is something we do look at. And that's been really helpful in our own hiring, especially when we're hiring people who are like gonna be teaching our sexual health curriculum. Those are very specific questions we ask. Are you comfortable talking about gender identity? Are you comfortable talking about sexual orientation? And we see that really translate to the quality work that's done. Um, so I just wanted to make that quick point as somebody from the school-based level on hiring committees, we do try to ascertain that too, to make that connection. Cause I agree, adult allies are important in that work, but that's all I'll say. Thank you. Kamani. Hi, thank you, Councilor Mejia. Um, I view this, I, I, I sort of view this as a, as a um, two-sided thing, um, sort of like a, a proactive and a reactive approach. Um, I think in terms of having systems set up for LGBTQ plus students um, so that, you know, they can connect with people and, and then talk with people through any um, experiences or hardships that they're having is absolutely important, um, you know, having that tailored specifically for them. Um, I also think, though, that, you know, me, I'm an individual, whenever I'm discussing, whenever I'm engaged in solution-oriented conversation in regards to policy, um, and um, for those who know me, I love politics, <laughs> hate it and love it, I'm studying it currently. Um, oh, can you all hear me? Did I freeze? You froze, but we Hello? can you, oh, no, you're good. Don't worry. Hello? I called Tom and I told him to get their life. I can hear you. Oh, you're good. I, I'm back. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, I'm so sorry. The internet here is so spotty. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, um, me personally, um, I, you know, I was able to sort of tune out um, for a, a very, I was very quickly able to tune out um, all of the bullying that I was receiving and focus on my grades. Um, and honestly, school for me, um, had always been sort of like where I 
um, engaging in schoolwork, I disappeared in it, essentially. So it was sort of kind of like my escape. Um, so that's how it was for me. Um, I know that for a lot of people, that was not the case. And so, and, you know, that's because, you know, there were times when I was in a classroom sitting with people who were making fun of me or, you know, they were very, it was, you know, they were very obviously, you know, like whispering about me or like, you know, trying to make it very obvious that they disapproved of me and my identity. And being a student in a classroom and having that go on, that's distracting in and of itself. Like, I would, there would be, I, I remember many days in high school where I would just be sitting in class thinking, well, really looking at my phone, watching the minutes go by, like, I can't wait to get out of this class. I can't wait to get out of this building. Like, I can't wait to leave. I can't wait for the weekend. I can't wait for the end of the school year. You know what I mean? And all of that takes away from the actual journey of an, an experience of actually just being in the moment and learning and being able to appreciate what you're being taught. So I think, you know, I could, I think, I, I hope that offers some perspective in terms of why LGBTQ plus students probably, um, you know, aren't doing as well as non LGBTQ plus students in terms of their grades. And this really does require, again, some proactive work, um, work that I had laid out earlier in my mm -hmm. testimony, work that many of you have already spoken towards. And it, it just takes a lot of, takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of re revolutionary work. I wish more BPS kids were here to um, talk more about that directly, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to uh, be mindful that one of our community panelists has a hard stop at 445, Councilor Lara. So I just wasn't sure if you had one more question to wrap up the administration panel. Is that is, we're good? We can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, before we wrap up the administration panel, just if those folks who need to leave just wanted to thank you for uh, leaning into this conversation for being vulnerable, because that is the only way that we're going to be able to move the work forward is if we are honest about the work that needs to be done. Um, so I really do appreciate you all uh, highlighting some of those challenges that, that you face. Um, and uh, I'm going to now transition over to the community panel. Kamani, you're more than welcome to stay. Everybody's welcome to stay here because we're here thank for you. this. Thank you. I'm okay. sorry, I have the event to go to, you but to thank you to? so much. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so for those who are still here, I'm going to transition over to the community panel, and I'm going to be starting with Dr. Jackman, who has been so incredibly gracious with her time, um, and call and got and, and call, got a call yesterday, and it was like, yes, I am there for you, girl. So so much appreciate you, my love. Um, you now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's I'm um, excited to be able to share some of my experiences, and I apologize I couldn't join. So. I hope that some of my remarks won't be, you know, repeated, but I wanted to actually was just really reacting to what Kimani was sharing and kind of the question about um, what contributes to the low performance of our LGBTQ plus youth. And, you know, just to say, to share, I worked in BPS up until 2021. I was the Dean of Health, Health and Wellness at Boston Arts Academy. And really, I would say we were kind of on the front lines of really thinking about how to support our youth um, at school. We had a high percentage of stu students who were open um, about their identity. Um, and so I, I feel to be privileged to be able to share and kind of represent some of what I learned over the course of my time being at BAA. Uh, but one in direct to the question, in response to the question about um, grades, I. I think the other piece we need to consider is that there are many young people who um, have families who are not supportive of their identity and they end up being homeless. And so get into school, you know, so I think about maybe they're not even at school on a consistent basis because they're trying to figure out their housing or resources about food or clothing. And so I want to just bring that piece in um, that around kind of our community resources, how are we ensuring that all aspects of a young person's life is being taken care of, right? If they're if they're worrying about safety and, and where a place to live, then it's gonna be really hard to be thinking about your grades. That that does not 
often is not the priority. And I uh, just wanted to know, um, know, Dr. Jackman, that we're moving into the community panel. So while I appreciate you starting off with providing some insight to that particular question that was asked earlier, would love for you to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about your work, you know, as a, as a clinician and working in the Boston Public Schools um, and looking at the intersection of mental health and wellness and uh, our, particularly within our LGBTQ plus youth community. So any perspective and insight that you can lean in and offer in terms of just kind of like the bright spots and some of the spaces and places that we might be able to uh, improve upon. So if you could, from that perspective, you now have the floor for that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, again, I am a licensed psychologist, clinical psychologist, and have worked with in, and with BPS for 17 years initially through a partnership with Children's Hospital and then 10 years as a BPS employee. And I would say over the course of that time, I've again had the privilege to work and support young people who are various um, stages of transition around their both their gender identity and their sexual orientation identity. Um, I would say bright spots. Um, I think having clinicians in schools provided our young people with with people who they know they could trust um, with sharing their identity and navigating that process, um, whether it's communicating with teachers and school leaders about their own identity and the pronouns they want to use, um, or again, accessing resources in the community if they were um, thrown out of their homes. Um, being a place, a, a resource to provide mental health resources and counseling in, in, in the school-based setting. So I think I, I would say, and also one of the things we, we, we hosted um, or held, we had a, a, a student-led um, group. Um, it started out as GSA, Gay Straight Alliance, and chain evolved over time as our students' language and sense of how they want to be identified as a support group change to, um, to another um, acronym, SAFE, um, Students' Alliance for, um, I think, Gender Equality? No, I forgot, I forgot what the <laughs> Student Alliance for Equity, I think it was, was the name of it. Uh, that that will, should spell that out correctly. Um, and so also, you know, again, being clear with student voice, um, having teachers who were also open in, in the school setting where students knew that they were a safe place to go, um, having um, just tools, whether it's stickers or places where you could put on your door, acknowledging and, and announcing that you're a safe resource for young people. I think those were some really bright spots. For me, I think working with families around these topics and providing educational um, conversations for families around this topic um, of supporting our LGBTQ plus individual uh, students, um, I think were some really great ways in which we were able to um, advocate, ensuring that we had gender neutral bathrooms. Um, which seems like may seem like a very small thing, um, but was huge for people and for students to be able to advocate when we weren't using processes that were were affirming to say this is not working for us and for us to be engaging conversations with them around that. Um, we also did one of our part one of our interns um, administered a climate survey around LGBTQ um, plus youth which gave us really great data on how we were doing and what areas we needed to identify. So I think as, as a school, as an administrator, being open to that feedback and to listen and recognizing we didn't have all the answers and engaging our students to share what was what they needed in our in our school setting to feel safe and supported. I think when we think about the mental health piece, um, I think someone referenced the CDC report, the Youth Behavioral Survey. You know, it's very alarming. And even prior to COVID, um, the rates for LGBTQ plus youth were always very high and much higher than um, our heterosexual youth. And I just want to call that out. Um, some of the data that's alarming, um, they 
69% of youth in 2021, so this is during COVID, reported um, feeling uh, persistent sadness and hopelessness. So that's 69% of queer youth compared to 38% of heterosexual youth. So you see the discrepancy in the numbers. Um, another stat that I wanna highlight is um, youth who considered suicide, seriously considered suicide. Um, the numbers for, uh, for queer youth were 45% compared to 15% for heterosexual youth. Um, and youth who, LGBTQ plus youth who um, attempted suicide, those rates were 22% compared to 6% for heterosexual youth. Um, I think one, one of my critiques of the data, it doesn't look at intersectionality. And so I would argue that our queer youth of color also, um, you might see the numbers being more stark because they're often more social determinants that impact their functioning and day-to-day -day lives. I am willing to answer any questions that you have. I think those are some of the pieces I wanted to highlight. Um, housing, um, thinking about our social services and how they support youth um, who, again, are, are unhoused. Um, family education, I think, is a huge piece that we need to consider. And um, suicide prevention, um, again, given those the, the high numbers of youth who contemplate suicide. And one of the things that we find in the research is when a queer youth has a trusted adult, those numbers significantly decrease. They're, they're better able to function and feel more cured and supported. Thank you, Dr. Jackman. Really do appreciate you being with us here today. I know you have a hard stop at 4.45. I do I have a little more time, my schedule. Welcome. Freed up okay. a little bit, so. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go next to, if my colleagues don't mind, then going next to our next, uh, the community panelist. Um, the, I believe is Ms. Brooks. Um, you now have the floor um, for your testimony. And then what we'll do is a round of questions for both of you, if that's okay. That way we can, um, and we'll start with Dr. Jackman when it's time for questions. So you now have the floor. And thank you for your patience in being with us here today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you both for holding the hearing. My name is Shaplay Brooks, and I am the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth's um, Executive Director. Um, the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth is, has a three-pronged approach to the way that we do our work. One, we um, now are providing recommendations as an independent state agency to 20 state agencies um, on the gaps in service provision for LGBTQ youth, and we've been around for now 31 years. Um, the other part of what we do is our safe schools program that has also been around for 30 years. And with our safe schools program, um, we have several GSAs um, that are a part of our leadership council. And every year we have a, uh, a yearly summit um, for our leadership council and we're increasing those days as the years go on. Um, and this year they'll be there for five days and it's really a community building um, time for them and as well as um, they're able to learn different skills in facilitating racial equity, LGBTQ intersectionality and things and those things. Through that program, um, we have many, inf we have much information from students, but also our students through that program um, started a nonprofit where um, they address as student leaders um, the issues and the gaps in service provision, both in and across the board. Um, and so this year they have organized a national march um, and they have indicated, and I can just read just a couple of things from um, their letter, um, their demand letter. And this includes students all around the state um, in all six um, areas of the state. And so one of just starting, they said that we call to end um, the outing and ask teach teachers, parents, and peers to maintain confidentiality in regards to their gender. Um, they are constantly being outed by teachers about their um, sexuality, their gender identity, and the like. Um, another another demand that they have is that um, they're calling for school faculty and staff to undergo mandated LGBTQ-specific diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Um, 
They want a desi designated funding for at least one clearly designated and functioning gender neutral bathroom at all times as many staff um, use it as a, as a convenient place um, to be when they can't get to another bathroom so they don't have, they end up having to wait or go to a gendered bathroom. Um, they also brought up education and um, as a part of the Healthy Youth Act, um, and we are a partner um, in the coalition, is to provide medically accurate and inclusive sex ed. Um, and I hear that there is some of that there, but one of the other things that we're talked that has been spoken about here is that trans youth um, and non-binary youth are not properly counted in NYRBS data. Um, and given that, um, some of the things that the commission has done um, and that we continue to do, we've trained Boston School de um, Department um, uh, several several times and for several years, um, but I would agree with the accountability piece. Um, one one thing that we are focused on this year is the um, just approaching this in a holistic way. Um, as you were stating, um, Dr. Jackman, um, we look at the different systems um, that affect a child's well-being. So that could be DMH, DCF, DYS, all of these systems. Um, in conjunction with the Department of Secondary and Elementary Education um, affects students' lives. And so we're looking at the most marginalized person in the classroom, um, and that includes your, you know, neurodivergent youth, um, immigrant youth, and all that have been um, spoken about today, as well as obviously uh, QT BIPOC youth. Um, one of the things that we're also working on in, in terms of um, collaboration between across, or across state agencies is making sure that DCF and DESE, um, and this would include obviously Boston Public Schools, um, provide a parent education um, piece and we'll do that through some of our consultants um, and we've already um, asked for that to be added to our budget to be able to bring that into schools. But we also um, are really calling upon schools to provide a gender affirming items program as many students have reported their gender affirming items being kept from them um, for behavioral issues. Um, so if they are misbehaving in class, then they'll ask them to take off their wigs, they'll ask them to take to give them um, and they will put them in a locker until after school. Mm -hmm. um, this has happened several times. Um, another thing that has been reported um, Especially, especially with youth who have cognitive differences, um, this has been done with um, other things that have been reported. Is if you know they're wearing lipstick and their lipstick is too loud, and then they'll take their lipstick from them. Um, mm -hmm. And so, trans youth of color are especially targeted in this way. But to have a, a gender affirming items program within the school, making sure that um, those items, if they cannot be their true and authentic authentic selves at home. How do we protect the social and emotional health of youth within the schools to provide a program um, where, where they can be their whole selves at school? Um, I can go on and on and on, um, but we've gone over most of um, the data. Um, and as said, it does not properly reflect um, you know, what's happening with QC BIPOC youth. And so making sure that there is that intersectional um, lens placed on service provision and bringing parents into the fold. And so that's what we're focused on um, for this year in terms of our schools and making sure that youth voice is, is centered, um, especially QT BIPOC youth in the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you for that. I am going to move on um, to questions and we'll start with the lead sponsor, Councilor Lada. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Dr. Jackman um, and Ms. Brooks for being here with us today. I um, I think what you shared is helpful in the sense that it really gives us a North Star <laughs> in terms of where we need to go if, if, if we want to make sure that our, our schools are affirming places for um, queer young people, specifically queer young people of color. There, earlier on, we, you know, I was trying to kind of figure out where to start in terms of, oh, you know, maybe in middle school, maybe in high school. And I asked a question generally about how early do we see this? And one of the folks from the administration was like, gave an example of, oh, a teacher having a first grader come out to them. And so uh, the question, what I'm trying to ask is that there hasn't been a lot of conversation around younger students. And so my assumption is, given the example that was <laughs> given by BPS, is that it does happen in elementary school and that we see it 
um, very early on. And so I'm curious because we haven't talked a lot about younger children in elementary school. What do you think we can do to begin normalizing queerness and LGBTQ communities as early on as possible so that once students get to high school, you know, I'm listening to Kamani talk about their experience and I'm, you know, paying attention to the data on the surveys that shows that queer students are struggling more academically and so on and so forth. And so what do we do? What would it look like to start early um, inside of our schools? Like what are some of the interventions, programmings or suggestions that you would have to really begin having the conversation in elementary school? I'm happy to start and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Brooks will add to that piece as well. Um, and I'll say I'm a mom of a middle schooler and um, an elementary school. And so I think, you know, I think at schools, I think it becomes really tricky because I, I think there is often parents, you know, just about sex in general, right? And so anything connected to this, it always feels like the school goes too far. But very early on, you know, kids very early on are able to identify difference. And so I think it's sometimes in society as adults, we, we feel uncomfortable around certain topics. And so we don't want to approach it. Mm -hmm. I come from the, the lens, the, the perspective is that when we give students a language to talk about things that they may or may not be experiencing, it just allows us to normalize, normalize their experience. I think we see that around race, right? We don't want to talk to kids around race. You know, we don't want to talk to them around all kinds of different issues. But the reality is that they have, they see things, they hear things. And so if you can give them a language to process the questions they have or the things they're not sure about, it helps them to be more centered and, and more equipped to handle these topics as they get older. I love using books. I use that with my children to showcase people and different families and family configurations. So, you know, I think the books we choose are, you know, so we think about our curriculum, right? How do we look at that through our curriculum, through our library and what is, what, what books and other resources our children have exposure to. I think again, around this topic, you know, it's like when we think about suicide, people often say, well, if we talk about suicide, it's gonna plant something in their head. And that's not the truth at all. It's really about allowing people to understand maybe their experience, put words, give them words for their experience or the experience of someone who is close to them, whether it's a classmate or even a teacher. Um, I think I would honestly defer to, to the doctor for this question, but just to add, um, I, I agree. I think it, Kamani said it best, it's about deconstructing um, the gender norms that are already in schools and um, taking that, um, taking a lot of the gendered language out and off of the table. Um, honestly, I think it's about uh, diversifying even just the, the board of directors or the, um, um, in terms of um, our Department of Education. Um, it could be just as simple as that so that you have fresh new ideas um, and people who are um, well versed on the topic um, taking over um, in that regard. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I think the books is kind of like the first direction that I go to in terms of like programming. I'm like, is there a Pride Week happening at an elementary school where like the students get to wear bright colors and read books and learn about different kinds of families, right? Like thinking about um, yeah, like how do we, how, what is, it's, I think similar, we have this conversation similar to sex ed, like what is age appropriate? But to me, and at least I think of myself, like, you know, and myself in first grade, I was like, I, I know what was happening in first grade. I, I, I was being like made fun of for my skin color. I was also having my first crush on a boy. Like I, we, it's not, it, you know, when I, when I think about myself in elementary school, I, I know that it's not too early to start having these conversations. And so, um, you know, as someone who's not an educator, uh, at least for, you know, early education, that's kind of more why I was asking about what are some of the ways that we can target it for that age group uh, or start earlier. Go ahead. And I'm sorry, um, I said Miss Brooks, but then Dr. Jackman referred to you as Dr. I, Dr. Brooks. I know. 
I know that. I, yet. I, I, I not yet. That too. Oh, I'm just making sure because not you know, I know. I'm not about to down. No, no. I, I saw ED, sorry, I was thinking ED. <laughs> I was thinking, right. oh my God, I called Miss Brooks, Miss uh, Brooks. I should have been I calling like, I'm not about to downgrade you. Okay, okay. I thought that too. <laughs> even, even if I was, I, I would not have been offended. Um, labels are, are beyond me. <laughs> um, but I just did want to add that right now, I mean, while we can come up with um, different ways in which to educate our children. I think it's very important to think about what's happening in the state of Massachusetts right now. There are 43 districts that have experienced um, anti-LGBTQ attacks, as well as like, you know, in terms of uh, book bans and superintendents telling their um, their staff that they have to take down their pride flags and their Black Lives Matter flags, or they will be um, reprimanded. Um, they're signing um, letters, right? They're signing, uh, different letters from superintendents saying that they got the, they received the information and if they do not comply that they will be reprimanded. Um, so this is happening. And while, you know, there are parent groups that are out there, I think having this discussion um, in terms of like DESE providing overall um, guidance around what is happening in schools to protect teachers as well um, is a part, needs to be a part of that conversation as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's statewide. You see, like I'm sitting here thinking about BPS, like we're, we can do this here. And then just that, that's statewide, um, that zoom out. I was like 43, like what's going on? So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor Mejia, I have no further questions. I do have to get off very quickly because my kid's school bus is outside, but I will be right yeah. back. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor and, Lara. Can yeah. I add to what Ms. Brooks just said? Um, because I think that that policies are really important. Be and, and I remember when um, Desi came out with the policy which allowed um, young people to change their names. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, that was very helpful for me as someone in, in an administrative role at the school be able to be able to do this and have like everybody in my school respond because it was a it was a legal right for our youth. And so I think that helps us to also, or helps teachers or administrators to navigate the pushback that you might get from other teachers or parents or other people who might disagree with the policies. I have to go back off mute. My daughter just came home from school. The whole world is coming to an end. Well, I mean, you know, she's, and though, you know, we got, you want to, you want to come by? No, okay. Um, so I, I, I know that you were just finishing up, Dr. Jackman, and I was going to have to come in and say something. So I wanted to just give you the heads up that um, I was going to ask you to fill a bus for me for a little bit while this child makes her way as you can see she's crawling <laughs> on the floor happy to help it didn't work we saw you on, we saw you on camera and this was a public hearing so it's not a zoom meeting where i can act a fool um so sorry about that little disruption um but while she um is crawling back into her room i i mentioned earlier that you know, when Councilor Lada was asking about how old is, uh, you know, what is considered age appropriate, you know, when um, Annalise was probably eight or nine, or even as early as seven, she was already asking questions about, you know, he, they, she, you know, um, just because we, you know, she's growing up in a household that is really open and inclusive and really, you know, leaning into, you know, questions of just like allowing. Um, for people to be fully expressed. Um, and I remember there was a one, one, once upon a time, I think she was probably eight or nine, she had literally shaved uh, all her hair off. And she was um, at the time, uh, just, you know, she cut all her hair off. And I remember her sharing with me that, um, that people were saying they were calling her she and they didn't know if, what if she wanted to be a she, he and like she was eight or nine years old and she was having this conversation with me as you know eight or nine year old and so incredibly um articulate about that right and even though it was just a haircut just the assumptions that people were making about her gender identity even at you know nine years old so i, I think there is something to be said about 
how we as adults and the work that we need to do to make sure that we are utilizing the right language um, that is affirming despite whatever our values or personal beliefs are as Kamani mentioned earlier, you know, that it's important for us to recognize that. I, I think that it's about standards right off, the, you know, right across the board in terms of how we're gonna show up for our, our kiddos. Um, and, and, and do so in a way that young people won't feel the need to question why people are questioning their gender identity if they you know, want to be expressed in one way or another. And that led my daughter to join a GSA at her school and she was in the fifth grade, okay? So when we talk about um, creating space for young people um, as early as however, whatever grade they need to be in, there needs to be space for, for them to be seen and fully expressed and, and heard. Um, and now my daughter has transitioned into being an ally, right, in the GSA space, right? But I think it was through that journey, and and luckily she was able to have a space to have that ability to question, right, and to do so with love. I, I think that really yeah. created the environment for her to feel fully expressed and embraced because her school set up that dynamic and because she was experiencing that at home. But I don't think that that's the case for so many of our kids. And it, and it breaks my heart, um, Dr. Soon-to-be Brooks, because um, you said not yet, but I'm just gonna claim it right now, <laughs> is that this is happening in 43 districts and which is what Councilor Lada just said that we were just thinking about BPS and to know that this is happening in Massachusetts and to know that we are gonna have to fight Desi, right? To, you know, um, push on policies is just, it, it just really, it makes me think and, and it, it makes me pause and, but it still makes me feel incredibly hopeful that we have women of color like yourselves here in this space leading these conversations, right? Because that also changes the work and, 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 and the insight that is, that, that is provided and, and shared here. So while I did say a lot and probably there was no question in that whole mumble jumble that I just said, I, I will um, just ask if, you know, in terms of just really thinking about how we can seize this moment on the council and where do you feel are some potential areas of growth that we have under quote unquote our control, right? Because we really don't have much power other than just yelling at people and trying to influence them to do the right thing. But would love to hear any recommendations or suggestions that you can share with us as we continue to have these conversations to help support our young people. Yeah, I mean, I think some, um, you know, this, you know, one of the things I would say is that the language is always changing. And I think young people are, the language and the words they use is constantly changing. And so I think as um, adults, <laughs> we need to be flexible with that and not um, be impatient or frustrated by that. Um, I also think that it is really important that we also think about even in our lives, in our everyday lives, how are we othering people when we ask, for example, someone who's pregnant, is it a boy or a girl? Or we ask someone, we meet, oh, do you have a boy or a girl? Right, every time people may not, we don't know. And I've also made that mistake and, and have you know learned to apologize and correct myself. And so, you know, being patient with yourself in this process, but knowing that when we stay on the binary, we we can other and offend people whose children may not be on the binary. And so being really mindful that we don't know. We don't know anyone we encounter. Every time we ask that question, we're potentially othering someone in that space. And that can feel really invalidating. Um, so that just think about, just again, it's a, a practice you can take in your daily life. I think as we think about these policies and we think about how does that sh look then in a school as a teacher, right? How are you making space for young people to share their pronouns if they choose, right? Not making that a requirement because people may not be ready to share their pronouns with you. So how are you creating space for people to show up and be and, and be ready to learn? Um, in terms of we talk about curriculum or whose voices 
are represented? Do we have expansive voices um, in the, the, concept, the books that you're choosing for students to read? Do they see themselves in there? How do you create space as a teacher or a school leader for, for young people to feel safe to share with you those aspects of their identity that they may feel they need to hide? How do you create that openness and inclusion for them to feel safe in your space, in your school? So they show up ready to learn and to take in all the goodness and greatness that you have to offer. So I think that's a challenge. And I, I think I ask as school leaders and then also as the state, as you mentioned that, how do we make sure we're putting policies and practices in place that allows inclusion. And I'm so excited to connect with Ms. Brooks and to hear about the work she's doing on the state level. And clearly coming from, you know, you hear, I, I could hear all the student voices as you shared the things that they're asking for, which are basic human rights, right? You know, that we need to get our stuff together so they don't need to ask. Um, that we just respond and we don't question why that why that is needed or what that might cost, that these, these things that they're asking for connect directly to their mental health and well-being. And if you think about, we're thinking about the mental health of our young people in general, that if a child isn't feeling included, then we're going to continue to see high rates of depression, hopelessness, and suicide. Thank you. Ms. Brooks. Um, I think I would add to just say um, there are a few um, there are a few current laws that are on the books um, that you know the HYA in terms of like the Healthy Youth Act um, is looking to you know adopt some of the language from um, and some of those and some of that language is inherently um, anti LGBTQ um, and I would say it's. I can just call it out for what it is. It's it's transphobic and homophobic language. Um, and they're just three little words, right? So I think one thing that we can do is um, join, co that you can do is join coalitions like the Healthy Youth Act and um, other, in terms of educator diversities, those co uh, coalitions, the Massachusetts um, Parentage Act, those coalitions in order to see where your voice can be utilized um, and where you can leverage, um, where they can leverage you to have conversations on a broader level. Um, I love that we're having conversations about Boston. I mean, where this it's the central um, location, and it's the lighthouse. But I think what we've done as a state is we're very siloed. And if we fight for all, right, um, and what you're going to do now, um, then we'll see that equity come to fruition. Um, I definitely there there are several things like especially with the legislator we we with the legislature we get um, bills all the time um, that we're asked to look over and I think like you said it best there are black women in power now that um, and as a queer black professional myself I can say that there's a couple of different lenses in which um, sharpen you know um, my vision to to see things a little differently than other people have seen it for a while um, and so just coming in and the time that I've been here I've had to provide comment on several bills um, that were um, laced, unfortunately, with, and I think with good intention, right? But laced with some form of like unconscious bias, which, you know, just bleeds into racism, right? Um, and transphobia and, um, and homophobia. So I think um, having more of, a, more of a hand in some of those um, that are specific to LGBTQ youth and that are intersectional with what we're, we're looking for, um, for a QC BIPOC youth, I think that's important. Um, and then I would, lastly, I would just say with the Department of Education, having taken this conversation a bit further, we, on Monday, Tuesday, we recently met with um, the commissioner and students were there um, in that meeting and they really tried to, uplift, we tried to uplift their voice and there was a lot of, you know, the same kind of, well, we do this and we do this and we do this. And so I think what you've done here in this meeting is to call BPS specifically on um, some of the areas where they can show us that they need improvement. Um, and we need to do that at the state level as well. Thank you, thank you. And yes, I'm all about uh, uplifting and acknowledging the shift in power, um, because that's how conversations change, right? If you have the same type of people in the same type of spaces, you're always gonna have the same type of conversations, right? And I think that that's the beauty of inclusivity. Um, and it's not just about diversity either. I think it's really being intentional about how we include people, even people who we may not get along with, right? Just saying. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to, in the interest of just making sure that we uh, keep on task, I know that the goal is that the hearing is until five. Wanted to see if Councillor Lada, you had any um, closing uh, or any other additional questions. Uh, I'm gonna see if we have anybody lined up for public testimony, but wanted to just be super mindful that we um, just wanted to give a time check and see. Um, if uh, Megan, if you could let me know if we have anyone signed up for public testimony so that we can prepare ourselves for such. Um, but I'd love to give the floor back to Councillor Lada for any closing remarks. Thank you, um, Councillor Mejia. Um, there's, I, I don't, I, I'm just I'm grateful for the work that you're doing and for everything that you brought here today. As you were speaking, as you saw, my, my son Zaire just walked in from school and was playing on my lap. And I was like, oh, let me hand you one of your cell phone games. And as you were speaking, I'm opening the game and the question, and I know you can't see my phone, is, is Zaire a boy or a girl? Mm. <laughs> on the beginning of the app. <laughs> as you were saying that, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> now, it does give you the option to skip it, but it's just like, you know, it's just like right in your face. And so I just wanted to affirm that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and just gratitude for, for your work. Um, the purpose, and I don't know if either of you were here at the beginning, but this is a part of, my office sent out a survey um, called a Letters from the Future survey, where we basically got letters from the future. It was a creative writing exercise for queer people across the city to basically send letters from the future to tell us how we solved, how they think we solved some of our most pressing issues so we could identify what they thought was were the most pressing issues. And we got responses from a lot of BPS students uh, who brought this up. And so this is one of six hearings that are gonna be a part of basically some like policy recommendations. And so your recommendations are going to be included in our Beyond Pride policy recommendation. And the hope is that uh, my office, my council colleagues and everybody will see this as a call to action and take on the things that they feel speak to them the most um, that they wanna move forward either through the council, through the city hall or at the state level. Uh, so that's, that's our hope. So we're, we're gonna basically, everything that you said here will be put to good use and included in really creating a platform that will make us a more inclusive Boston. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lada. I also will end with um, gratitude. You know, I, um, I started off my career in youth development in the early 90s and worked with Bagley and worked with Boston Glass and then moved on to New York where I worked at the Hetrick Martin Institute, the home of the Harvey Milk School. And I say all of that because in all of those spaces and places, um, I, I, I learned something about how I can be a better advocate, how I can be a better ally, and more importantly, how I can hold myself accountable to what it looks like to really create meaningful relationships and partnerships with folks. And so, you know, I feel like all of these conversations always bring me back to a full circle moment. I've been working in the education space too, particularly around trauma-informed practices. Um, and, and care, if you will. Um, I want to make sure that whatever little time I have on this council, as I continue to be an agitator, right, as disruptive as possible. Because what we're trying to do um, is work that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. And th this, these hearings give us some insight and a glimpse at kind of the realities that so many of our children are, are experiencing as they navigate our Boston public schools. And it's an opportunity for us as empowered adults um, to utilize our platforms to not only be able to shift the culture, but to hold that, that climate accountable to what really feels like young people feeling seen, heard, and affirmed. And so I'm here for that work. Um, and I am really um, grateful to Councilor Lada for allowing me to not only be a um, co-sponsor with her alongside this, but um, a thought partner um, as we continue to be as disruptive as we need to be. Um, so I wanted to just thank her for her leadership um, and her intentionality to really have a people-led um, policymaking platform. I think that that's what this moment is all about. So just wanted to thank BPS, the administration, Kamani for joining us all the way from Hungary, um, and Dr. Jackman, and soon to be Dr. Brooks, because we're claiming that girl, I'm just saying, um, for, for spending time with us this afternoon. And, and, and I, we look forward to uh, continuing the work and figuring out where do we go from here?
So with that, I don't believe that we don't have anyone signed up for um, testimony. I'm happy to say that we are ending on time and this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you so much, Chair, and thank you all. Thank you. Um, Councilor Lara?